Our next broadcast is a supernatural fantasy series that ran from 1943 through 1945. There were 78 episodes produced altogether. The show's strength was stories from famous writers of the two genres, including Robert Louis Stevenson, Victor Hugo, Edgar Allan Poe, and even Charles Dickens. One of the more unusual aspects of the show was that there was no music, other than between scenes. Some have claimed that this lack of music helps to keep the show from being dated, as it remains fresh to this day. We present to you The Weird Circle on Hojo Radio. The Weird Circle. In this cave by the restless sea, we are met to call from out of the past stories, strange and weird. Bellkeeper, toll the bell so that all may know we are gathered again in the weird circle. history of the House of Usher. I am leaving it as my last will and testament, because before this year is over, the cavernous tarn will close over the gables of our decadent home. It was written by our ancestors many years ago that when the rains are blood red, the House of Usher will crumble to the earth. There are three members of the Usher family living, two in direct descent, the Lady Madeline and her twin brother, Roderick. I was engaged to marry Roderick long before I knew my cousin. It is the custom for the Usher family to intermarry. The Lady Madeline has been confined to bed these many weeks, waiting for death, waiting for the last days of her life to pass quietly. I have so little time left, Roderick. I must see Charles before I die. Charles Wilson is tied up in London on business. He can't come down here every time you've a whim to see him. Oh, this is no whim. It's just a matter of days before I... Don't be impatient with me. Sister, please. Oh, afraid of the truth, Roderick? You've always been afraid of me. I can read your mind so easily. Look at me, brother. Let's not argue again. You've always wanted me to die. You've waited for it year after year, praying and hoping that I die, leaving you free to inherit the house and the fortune. But you'll be fooled. Look. Look at the rain. This isn't you speaking. It's the fever. Fever or not, the rain is turning red, isn't it? Yes, it, it seems that way at times. Each day it will be redder and redder. And darker and... Madeline. Afraid, brother? Are you afraid of blood-red rains? The doctor said you should have rest and quiet. You, you weaken yourself when you're excited. Where's Dina? I don't know. I'm not her keeper. She's downstairs, probably, buried in that romantic nonsense that she reads. Every girl likes to read romantic stories, Rod. Heaven help her when she becomes your wife. Call her for me, will you? The doctor's orders were that you're not to be disturbed. Call her, Rod. Do as I say. For your own good, I... I'll get even with you someday. Dina? 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 Madeline. Dina? Did you call me Lady Madeline? Yes, Dina Child. Come here, my dear. Is there something I can do for you? Yes. 
I want to see Charles Wilson before... Before I die. I told you he was busy, Maddie. Tell Talbot to hitch up the coach in for Dina. Go to London tonight. Tell Charles... I must see him right away. Bring him back with you. I'll not have Dina go out in this weather. But, Roderick... Dina, please go. Don't listen to Rod. Do this for me. I will not have strangers dragged into our family secrets. Charles Wilson is no stranger. He's the only one who knows the secret of the house of Usher. I don't like leaving you, cousin. The doctor will be here shortly. Hurry, my dear, and bring Charles back. I forbid it, Dina. If I don't see Charles tonight, I'll be buried alive. Not able to live. Not able to die. We'll never get through to London tonight, Mum. Not in this weather. Not in a million years. It ain't a night for humans to be a bat. The Lady Madeline is dying. The least we can do is grant her her last wish. Dina! Dina! Quickly, Talbot, before Lord Rick tries to catch up with us. Dina, did you hear me call you? Yes, I heard you, cousin. I'll try to protect you, child, because I love you. I don't want any harm to come to my future wife. Please, Rod. What? You turn for me when I touch you? I don't know. Afraid of me? I, I... Answer me, Dina. Are you afraid of me? Yes. But you loved me once. That was before we returned to the house of Osher. And you're going anyway? Yes, Roderick. For Madeline's sake. Are you ready, Mum? Yes. Yes, Talbot, ready. We'll be back by midnight, Roderick. All right, cousin. Or else the lady Madeline might not live long enough to get her last wish. Did she leave, Roderick? Yes. Madeline, why don't you confide in me? Why must you call in strangers when you know how it humiliates me? I can't trust you, Roderick. Ever since we were children, you've kept one secret from me. What is that secret, Madeline? <laughs> That's one thing you never read aloud of me. What is that secret, Maddie? Leave me alone, brother. I'm ill. You're dying, Madeline. You know you're dying. The secret won't do you any good. Now, what is it? Please, Roderick. Tell me, Madeline, or you won't live to die the way you think you will. <laughs> Tell me, or by heaven, I'll force it out of you. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh whoa there, whoa, boy. Uh, this is his house, Mum. Thank you, Talbot. Mr. Wilson, is he here? Yes, sir. Why, Dina Usher, what are you doing in London at this hour of the night? Come in, my dear. The Lady Madeline sent me. Great heavens, child, your clothes are dressed. Come on in. I'll fix you some hot tea. Oh, we haven't time, Charles. Madeline wants to see you at once. Please come with me right away. The doctor doesn't think she'll live through the night. Madeline? Darling? Oh, she's been ill for months. Charles, you wouldn't know her anymore. Why didn't you let me know before this? Roderick wouldn't let me. Roderick? But why? I can't explain now, Charles. Believe me when I say it's important that you come at once. Talbot's waiting outside. I'm frightened for Madeline. We've got to be back by midnight. <laughs> You came in time, Doctor. Lady Usher, you shouldn't allow your brother to excite you. He has a cruel streak in him at times. Surprisingly like my grandfather. What time is it? Midnight. Here, drink this. It will give you strength. Oh, I can't move. Uh, lean against me. There. Dr. Bain, you've attended all my family, haven't you? Yes, Lady Usher. You've been closer to us than almost anyone. If I ask you for an honest answer, would you give it to me? That depends on the question. How much longer have I to live? Years, my dear. No, Doctor. I want an honest answer. 
to you. It's imperative, but I know. I don't know really, my dear. I'm going as fast as the horses can go, Mum. Get up. Get up. Faster, Talbot. We won't accomplish anything at all if you lose self-control, Dina. Oh, I'm sorry, Charles, but I've the most dreadful foreboding. Foreboding? Well, I thought Madeline and Roderick were as close as brother and sister could possibly be. They were until about a year ago. What caused the change? Well, I'd been living at the house of Usher for about four months when Roderick suddenly became, well, nervous, jumpy. He'd lock himself up in his room for days. He was morbid. Frightfully morbid. Sounds like a depression of spirit. Oh, it's went deeper than that. Madeline fell ill at the same time. And then the horrible reddish rains began to fall. Red rain? Dina, really? Oh, you'll see. The first day those rains began to fall, the rift between Madden and Roderick widened. Until now, their hate is a living thing. It fills the house. They seem to be battling constantly for possession of each other's soul. Charles, look. Look ahead. There's the house. And the rain. Look at the rain. Yes. Red rain. Well, Charles, uh, do come in. We, we've been waiting for you. Oh, it's good to see you again, Roderick. Come in, Dina. Don't stand there staring at me. It's been a long time since I've last seen you, Rod. Yes, uh, a long time. Let me take your coat, Charles. I'll hang it up. Thank you, dear. My sister's waiting, Charles. You'd better go right up. Yes, uh, of course. I'd better warn you, Madeline's delirious. She doesn't quite know what she's saying. Sometime. Uh, Rod, uh, why don't you come up with me? She expressed a desire to see you alone. Charles. Oh, Charles, I'm so glad you came. I had to see you alone. Madeline, don't try to sit up. You'll only weaken oh, yourself. Sit over here, Charles, next to me. You're the only person I can trust, and you must promise to do exactly as I say. Of course, of course. Oh, remember what I told you years ago. Remember about Roderick and me. I told you then that he and I were more than twins. Well, that was just childish fancy. Oh, I wish to God it were. But those suspicions have all been proven these last few months. Roderick and I are, are only one person. Not two. We have two earthly bodies, but we share one soul. When Charles and I were born, our shoulders were attached. The day of our birth, we were separated. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean you share one soul. I've never been able to feel anything for myself. His thoughts are my thoughts. His tears are my tears. His weaknesses are mine. Don't you understand, Charles? Are you sure of this, Madeline? Positive. His mind has the initiative. He doesn't respond to my emotions. Because I had none. None. I'm cold without him. Don't you see? My earthly body is wasting away. But my soul is not my own. As long as he's alive, Charles, the power of his life will keep me living. Madeline, Lady Madeline, you mustn't even think of it. Oh, it's true, though. I'll have a living death. I'll be buried alive. Unable to live. Unable to die. Madeline. That's why I called you here. Promise me now, Charles. You'll never allow my coffin to be sealed. Keep my body in this house. You must rest, Madeline. Stop talking. Do you promise, death. Charles? Promise. Yes, yes, of course I do. Don't, don't tell Roderick Charles, ever. He'll seal me in my tomb alive. Madeline, my, my dear. Every mortal is entitled to his own soul. If I can't rest in death. If I can't rest in death, I'll return from the grave and take him with me. My promise is my word. What are you doing standing outside this door, Roderick? Tina. Mad enough to see Charles in privacy. Why do you insist on spying on your own sister? Shut up. I can't understand you, Roderick. There are many things you can't understand, Tina. Come with me downstairs. Let me go. Come along. It's the living room. I'd like to go in and tell Madeline that you were spying on her again. Tell her if you wish. 
She's a poor, sick thing, unable to lift her arm against me. I don't know how I ever loved you. You'll learn to again after we're married. I hate you, Roderick Usher. I'll never marry you. I... I... In heaven's name! Roderick! Roderick, what's the matter? Pain inside me, crawling like vermin. I... Help me, Dina. Oh, of course. Help me. Roderick! <laughs> Dina! It's Madeline! She's dead! <sighs> Madeline, beside your bed. You're dead, Madeline. Dead. Two people fought for the possession of one soul, and you've lost. <laughs> You'll try to drag me to the grave with you, but you're weaker than I, Madeline. You'll never return. Never. And that was her last request, Doctor. It's a peculiar request, Mr. Wilson. I know it is, Doctor, but it was the Lady Madeline's last wish. Oh, Roderick. What are you doing here? Taking a last look at my beloved sister's face. Oh. Doctor, I'm not quite sure that the Lady Madeline is dead. Look at the flush of life in her cheeks. Stop speaking like a fool, Charles. Look for yourself, Roderick. What are you trying to do, frighten me? No. I've asked the doctor to verify her death. In cases of this kind, Mr. Wilson, death from catalepsy, the deceased often retains a lifelike flush. But it's merely symptomatic. Nothing supernatural about it. Of course she's dead. Isn't she, Doctor? However, if you feel the slightest doubt... No doubt at all. I'd suggest delaying the burial for a week or two. As the nearest of kin, I want the funeral held at once. She'll be laid to rest in the family catacombs beneath the house. Roderick, I gave her my word. Your word isn't valid. You're not one of the family. But it was my word of honor. Don't mix in family affairs, Charles. But the least you can do is grant her last wish, Roderick. This is nonsense. The dead are best buried. But, Rod, your own sister... No. As the doctor in the case, I don't feel justified in making out a death certificate for two weeks. The Lady Madeline will lie in state in her coffin in the catacombs. The coffin will remain open. For 30 years, these catacombs have been unused. Look at the walls, Dina. Time has encrusted them with nitre. Oh, it's cold in here. Cold and damp. Let's take the coffin this way, Talbot. Watch out, Charles. Don't fall. Be careful. The catacombs have always been soft with slime and nitre. Hard to breathe in here at times, isn't it? Where's the room, Roderick? Ahead. At the end of the corridor. Are you positive we can keep a fire burning in there? Yes, Charles. Uh, Talbot. Yes, sir. Did you start the fire? Oh, yes, sir. I did that early this morning. The room ought to be warm by now, sir. Talbot's a dependable man. He starts warm fires to bring life to death. Roderick, how can you act like that? Your own sister. Yes, my own dear, beloved sister. Hey, Charles, look ahead of you. A tiny room at the end of a corridor. The fire is blazing. Be careful. Careful with the casket. We'll place it on the table. Center of the room. All right, sir. We can place it down. Yes. Yes, top. Down there. I know that my redeemer will rest in peace. And that he shall stand at the latter day peace. upon the earth. And though this body be destroyed, yet shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold and not as a stranger. We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. The Lord giveth, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Talbot? Talbot? Yes, ma'am. Why, Mum, what are you doing up at this hour of the night? I can't sleep. I keep dreaming the Lady Madeline is crying for help. Where's Lord Roderick? Well, he couldn't sleep either, Mum. He said he was worried that his sister was cold, Mum. Whatever does he mean by that? Did he go down to the catacombs? Yes, Mum, that he did. He said he wanted to stir the fires a bit. Down there? Oh, wait a minute, Mum. 
Later, Talbot. I must stop him. I must... I wouldn't go down there, Mum. It's ever so cold at night and damp. I wouldn't go down there myself. I advised Lord Roderick against it, Mum. I did. I told Roderick! 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 The door. The door slammed shut. It's so dark in here. Cold and dark. Roderick! Roderick! Roderick, where are you? Rod! Rod, answer me! Rod! Roderick! Roderick, I can't see! I don't like these goings on at all, I don't. People dying and not getting themselves properly buried. It ain't normal. No, that it ain't. Talbot. What? Are you out too, Mr. Wilson? Don't nobody sleep proper in this here house? Where are Miss Dina and Lord Roderick Talbot? Well, I was sitting here as nice as you please, sir. But where is Miss Dina Talbot? Well, yeah, that's what I'm getting to. I was drinking this here cup of tea. When Lord Roderick comes in a little past midnight, or it was a little before midnight. Where is he? Well, well, I'm getting to that. He comes in and he says he does... He wants a flame. Yes? Yeah. He says, as calm as you please, he wants to go down and keep his sister from getting cold. And Miss Dina? Well, as for her, she came down a little later and said she dreamt that the Lady Madeline was calling to her. So she follows Lord Roderick to the catacombs. It ain't proper, sir. It ain't proper. Roderick! Roderick! Oh, oh, there's the light. There. Are you calling me, cousin? Oh, Roderick. Roderick, I was so frightened. I thought I was lost. Why did you come down here? I, I dreamt Madeline needed me. Well, what did you do, Rod? Be quiet, Tina. You closed the coffin. Oh, how could you? Don't you approve? You, you were going to drive a, a stake through her coffin. She was a witch, Tina. A witch. Isn't it the custom to drive a stake through the heart of a witch? Watch, Dina. Watch. No. Watch me drive the hammer through a heart. What? Stop that. Stop. Stop that. What? Roderick, put that stake down ah. in heaven's name. Don't. Don't. Leave it alone. Take your hands off. Oh, please, Roderick. Please. It's so horrible. Don't you understand? It's your own sister. Your own sister. You'll pay for this, Dina. You and Madeline together. Oh, Roderick. Come and help me with this. Yes, sir. Pardon me, Lord Roderick. But... Oh. oh, Charles, darling. You came just in time. <laughs> He looks like he was dead, sir, lying there on the sofa. No. No, he's beginning to stir. Keep bathing his face in cool water, dear. Uh, He'll be all right. I'm afraid the shock of Madeline's death is too much for him. The shock of her death, uh, the constant fall of the rain. It's getting redder all the time, Charles. Uh, yes, it is. That's just uh, an electric phenomenon. Oh, Don't try to move, Roderick. Oh, It's you, Dina. You again. Lie still, cousin. You'll feel better in a little while. You're both fools. You shouldn't have stopped me. She's a witch. Don't you understand? No, no, Roderick. Listen. Listen, Charles. What? Can't you hear it? What are you talking about? Listen. I told you once my hearing was super acute. I can hear a heart beating. You're over, Rod. Suppose I go for the doctor, Rod. He'll give you a sedative. No. No, don't leave me. But you need your sleep. Of course you do. All this horror tonight will pass over when the morning comes. And those infernal rains clear. It's not in my mind. She's coming. She's coming for me. I can hear her in the catacombs. Listen, Charles, listen. Roderick, please believe me that you're simply overwrought and emotional. I've got to get out of here. I must leave at once. She's coming for me. Coming. She swore she would. I know she did. I overheard. I overheard her talk with you, Charles. Roderick. Cousin, no, you're hearing things. Now, listen. I can't hear anything. She's leaving the catacombs now. Listen, Charles, don't you hear her breathing? Can't you hear her footsteps? Her sighs? She's in the hallway, Charles. In the hall. Help me, Charles. Help me, Charles. Roderick. She's coming closer. Faster. Faster. Her feet are on the stairs. One by one, she's coming up those stairs. Listen, you can hear her now, can't you? You can hear her now. Charles, 
Look out the window. The rains are blood red. She's outside the door. Listen. Listen, cousin, listen. Madeline! No, sister. No. Leave the house of Usher Charles. You and Dina, leave this cursed house at once. The rains are blood red. And I've come to reclaim my soul. Adler. Oh. And you, Roderick. You will be soulless forever. From that chamber and from that mansion, Charles and I fled aghast. The storm was still abroad in all its wrath as we crossed the park to the highway. The moon above the house of Usher was blood red. And Charles held me close as we walked on and on into the night. Dina, my darling, don't look back. The house has crumbled to the ground. Crumbled into the cavernous tide. Charles. Little Dina. You'll always be safe with me. of the past, we have heard another immortal tale in The Weird Circle. Bellkeeper, toll the bell. Be here in this lonely cave by the restless sea once again next time for another immortal tale in The Weird Circle. You're listening to Hojo Radio. More classic old-time radio coming your way next. We are met in this cave by the restless sea to reveal the horror in man's mind. Listen to the weird circle. Listen to the waves. Listen closely, for you will hear the crying of lost souls. Our story discloses the horror in man's mind. This is a tale of the house and the brain. Come with me to London, through the heavy fog of the city to a large house in the suburbs. A young couple enter the portals of that house to attend an art auction. Well, hello, Jim. We've been looking all over for you. We've got quite a crowd here today. Paul Whitney, Sandra. I'm glad you've come. I thought you two were refugees from this sort of thing. Well, frankly, Jim, I've suddenly conceived a passion for good oil paintings, and I'm going to buy this fabulous painting of the ancient cutthroats. Well, to tell you the truth, Jim, she suddenly conceived a passion for cutthroats, ancient or otherwise. Oh, <laughs> my husband abuses me. I'm too nice to her, or she'd never be interested in any other man. But, darling, the man in the portrait's been dead 400 years. Dead or living, he's not beyond your charms. <laughs> but my husband loves me, Jim. Must be my fatal fascination. Yes. <laughs> but I didn't come here to talk with you, even if it is fun. I came here to see that oil painting. Oh, it's quite a painting. Yes, so we've heard. It's in my study. Come and take a look before the auction starts. Hmm? Now, don't fall in love with it, Sandy. No matter how you feel about 15th century reprobates, I'm not going to spend a fortune buying useless pictures. <laughs> well, there's the picture. What do you think? He has a face you'll never forget. And a reputation. Yes, sir, he lived a full life. You know, he was supposed to have been fabulously wealthy. But when he died, his fortune disappeared. Oh, my dumpling aunt. He looks like the kind of man who sticks pins in people for the devil of it. Sandra. The strangest thing about the picture is the man's eyes. You get the feeling that the eyes are alive. Yes, very definitely. Clever work. Paul. What's the matter with you, Sandra? I could have sworn I've... I've seen that man in London recently. What man? 
the one in the picture. What? <laughs> He's been dead 400 years. Stop snickering at me, Jim. I know what I've seen. Impossible. The only thing left of the Honorable Cutthroat Richards is the house on Orchard Street. He built it 450 years ago, and it's never been really habitable since. Why? Well, this is your chance to laugh at me. It's haunted. Haunted? Oh, not really. Really? Oh, Jim, Jim, I've never met a ghost. And you never will, Santa. Jim, oh, Jim, please, please, oh, please, imagine a really, truly ghost. <laughs> Wonderful, Jim, take us over. Or better yet, I'll rent the place for a week. I've heard a lot about ghosts, but I've never been able to pin one down. You know, I've been a student of the occult for a long time. Jim, 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 police! Oh, Sandra, I'm serious. It's dangerous business, this ghost hunting. Uh, please, fella, anything to get Sandra's mind off buying that picture. Very well, but you'll find some very real ghosts over there. The housekeeper, Mrs. Browning, will rent you a room if you want one. But she's the only person who's ever been able to stay in the old house. <laughs> Thanks, old man. Come along, Sandra. But the picture... Hang the picture, my sweet. I've got a genuine ghost for you. open all by itself. There's no one there. Doors aren't supposed to open by themselves, Paul. Well, what do you expect? The house is haunted, isn't it? Hmm. Door slammed by itself, too. Woo! Tricky place, isn't it? You frightened? Not in the least. And it isn't my knees that are shaking, pet. It's yours. Wonder where the housekeeper is. Her name's Mrs. Browning. Call her and see what happens. All right. Mrs. Browning! <gasps> Don't poke me, Paul. I didn't poke you. Well, I didn't poke myself. Oh, hey. I wonder if we're alone. Look behind me, Paul. If it's a ghost, I don't want to meet it quite yet. Silly, it's broad daylight. Anybody knows ghosts never appear until nightfall. Paul, Paul, look. It's the child's footprint right there in front of me, a wet footprint. Great heavens. No, another one. Looks like the footprint of a child who's taken a bath. Oh, my chubby aunt. Listen. The footprints lead upstairs. Shall we follow? Well, it's the obvious thing to do. Gasping cold in here, Sandy, isn't it? Ghostly cold at any rate. <laughs> You're not quite up to form, old girl. You sure you want to go through with this? No, I'm positive. Almost anyway. Sandy, the footprints, they disappear. <laughs> maybe, it's, maybe it's all done with mirrors. Good afternoon. Do come in the sitting room. Oh, you must be Mrs. Browning. I'm Sandra Whitney, and this is my husband. How do you do? How do you do? Mr. Danvers told me you were coming. Won't you be seated? Thank you, Mrs. Browning. I hope my stepdaughter didn't frighten you. Your stepdaughter? Well, I didn't see anyone. Naturally. She's dead. You mean the footprints we saw? Yes, of course. Uh, you didn't see or hear anything else? Uh, no. Expecting anyone? Yes. They're coming for me shortly. My time is up, and I must die in the way they've planned it. They? Those who live in this house, Mrs. Whitney. Oh, God, Mrs. Browning, you don't really believe ghosts actually live here. Believe it? I know it. You see, Mr. Whitney, when I was first married 40 years ago, my husband, my stepdaughter, and myself moved into this house. They were here then. Why didn't you move out? Oh, we became used to them. Then my stepdaughter died. My husband had an unfortunate accident, and I was left alone. You've lived here alone ever since? Yes. Waiting for them to take me. Mrs. Browning, how much would you charge my wife and myself for an apartment here by the week? Charge? Nothing. Nothing at all. Anybody who has the courage to stay here is most welcome. But I advise you against it. Listen. What is it? Souls crying for release. Release from him. Oh, come, Mrs. Browning. You don't believe me? <laughs> you will when you move in. When can I expect you? Tonight at eight. How about it, Paul? That sounds jolly. You'll use the east wing. I'll have a fire lit for you. But let me warn you once again. They'll be waiting for you, day and night. <laughs> Sandra, all 
back. Of course, Paul. <laughs> Down back. <laughs> Down, I say. <laughs> oh, if you keep squirming, I'll never get you on a leash. <laughs> I'd better take some pistols along with us. Well, I'm not at all sure you can shoot a ghost, Paul. I'm not at all sure it is a ghost. Something awfully phony about all that. Oh, no. My intuition says there were ghosts in that house, darling, and I've a very perceptive intuition. Sandra, so, uh, you're not going to take Blackie with you. Well, of course I am. He's a watchdog, isn't he? But a uh, dog. Now, darling, remember how nicely he caught pheasant last year. But pheasant aren't the same thing as ghosts at all. Stuff and nonsense. You ready? All ready. Here's your coat, dear. Oh, look out the window, Paul. So peaceful out there. You've always been partial to twilight. Oh, reminds me of the time you courted me. <laughs> it was such a nice day. Paul, that man, the one on the street. What man? The one standing right out there. Look at him. That's the same man whose portrait we saw at Jim Danvers' house today. Sandra, Sandra, where are you going? To talk to him, Pat, of course. <laughs> My chubby aunt. It is him. Oh, excuse me, sir. I couldn't help noticing you and... You noticed me? You are Mr. Richards, aren't you? I've been known to many by many names. Oh, dear, please pardon me if I'm rude, but... Well, how in the devil did you manage to stay alive for 400 years? You will notice my eyes. Look deep. Deep. Oh, let me go. Let me go. Deeply into my eyes. You've never seen me before. You don't know me. You can never remember me again. Sandra, I hope you're properly ashamed of yourself, approaching strange men and asking them silly questions. Well, I'm sorry, Paul. It was stupid of me, but anybody can be wrong. Well, of course they can, but on the face of it, it was silly. Expecting a man who was alive 400 years ago to be roaming around loose. It wasn't a matter of looseness, Pet. It was a matter of liveness. Now, now, come on. Stop being a husband and hold my arm. I ought to tear it off and beat you over the head with it. Mm, he's so virile. But I love him. <laughs> well, come along, Sandy. There's your haunted house ahead. We don't want to keep Mrs. Browning waiting. Or the ghost. <laughs> that door again. Insidious feeling doors opening and slamming. Mrs. Browning! Mrs. Browning! I'm in the east wing, Mr. Whitney, just lighting the fire. You better go on up. This hall's drafty. Hey, Paul, it's more than cold in here. It's almost as if something or somebody is draining your body of all warmth. That's a pleasant thought, Sandy. Now that you've scared yourself stiff, move. Well, I was just getting in the mood for ghosts. Where's the east wing? This way, Mrs. Whitney. Oh, hello, Mrs. Browning. Well, this room looks cheerful. It's as gay as my mood. Nice fire, nice candles. <laughs> quiet, quiet, Blackie. You'll scare somebody. <laughs> A dog scare somebody? Not tonight. They came tonight. What came tonight? You see. Better make yourselves at home while you can. Blackie, sit down. Over here, Blackie. Look at him, Paul. The hairs on his head are standing on end. Be quiet, Blackie. Blackie! Look! I told you they were here. A luminous mass. A blue mass. Sandy, be careful. It's materializing. Coming for me. I knew it. Coming for me. Oh, Mrs. Darling, Paul. Fingers are choking her. Good heavens. Mrs. Browning. Paul, oh, Paul, stop this horrible Cut thing. Cut him. Cut him. Cut him. Cut him. It's horrible. It's all right, Sandy. It's all right, darling. Oh, it's, it's gone, hasn't it? Yes. It's gone. But Mrs. Browning, she's...
Mr. Danvers, I'm going to reconstruct the scene of the crime. Nobody tells Detective Hodges that a flesh and blood woman gets bumped off by a ghost. But I saw it myself. Oh, be quiet, Blackie. If you'd only relax, Detective Hodges, and go away, we'd catch the ghost for you. Quiet! I'm only trying to help, but I... Blackie, stop! Sandra, you're only confusing the issue. Paul's right, Sandra. Sit down over here. Jim Danvers, if you side with Paul, I'll never speak to you. Now, Mr. Whitney, if you don't mind, we'll go over the details again. What happened? Well, Mrs. Whitney and I were here in this room with Mrs. Browning when a blue mass suddenly floated in the door. The lights in the fireplace dimmed, the candles were extinguished, and Mrs. Browning began to scream. Why? Because she saw a ghost. It's really all so simple. Sandra, my dear. And then what happened? The mass suddenly materialized, at least sufficiently, for us to see two hands. Two hands without a body. The hands reached out, grasped Mrs. Browning by the throat, and... That was that. Thank you, Mrs. Whitney. I suppose you expect me to believe that story? There's no reason for you to doubt Mr. Whitney's word, Detective Hodge. I'm not saying there is. But there was only three people in this room, and one of them is dead. Everybody's under arrest. Everybody, do you hear? Paul, Paul, it's here again. Look, Detective Hodge. Uh, Paul, Sandra. Oh, Paul, for heaven's sake. Uh, uh, what is it? An axe murderer in ectoplasm. Sandra, don't be funny. Let's get out of this house before it gets all of us. It's gone. Yes, it's gone. Now do you believe us, Detective Hodge? Yes. Yes, I, I believe you. I'll have Mrs. Browning's body removed to the morgue right away. Paul, if you insist on staying in this house overnight, I'll not be responsible for what happens. But, Jim, I'm convinced that there are no such things as ghosts. Now, now please, Jim, take Sandra back home and leave me. I'm not budging without you, uh, Pat. Sandra, don't be foolish. Well, no matter what you two do, I'm not staying here. Oh, go, old fuzzy beard. Take thy tired body and deliver it to a safe, warm bed. Poor Jim. Scared of a little ghost. <laughs> it's 11 p.m. already. Well, good night, Paul, Sandra. Nighty-night, Jim. What was that? You mean the footfalls? Yes, what is it? The housekeeper's dead stepdaughter. You see, it's all so simple. Good grief. Good night. <laughs> oh, we've been all through the house, Paul, and I'm dead tired. Come on, let's go to bed. You go to bed. I'll sit up and read these letters we found in the attic. <laughs> Here, Blackie, come here, come here. Now lie down next to me. There, poor Blackie, poor doggie. You don't like the ghosties, do you, Pat? Poor, poor Blackie. Hey, this letter's interesting. What is it? Evidently a letter from the housekeeper to her husband. A love letter. She talks about her brother's child. It seems her brother left his money to his daughter and she handled the estate for the child. Hmm, that's jolly. Maybe that's the child she calls her stepdaughter. Hmm. Uh, let's see what it says. Listen. Since we have managed the child's end, you and I are more than lovers. We are partners in many things. Sounds as if they murdered the child. Yes, it does. Sandra, I wonder if my theory's right. If people felt strong passions, and if those passions linger in a house after the people have gone, couldn't that create a heavy psychic atmosphere? Well, those fingers that murdered Mrs. Browning were more than heavily psychic. Unhook the collar of my dress, Paul. Where do I put the letters down on the dressing table here? Just a top hook. Oh, better keep these pistols handy just in case. Something about a gun that gives me courage. Funny. Oh, it's midnight. I'm tired and nothing's funny. You know Mrs. Browning's sitting room? It seems to be an extra addition to this house. It, it juts out from the rest of the building like a sleeping porch. What's funny about that? Well, that horrible cold and the footfalls all seem to emanate from that room. Oh, you and your logical mind. Oh. What's the matter, Sandy? Oh, look. The fire's dimming. Oh. Just, oh. Just like a great black shadow standing in front of it. Give me my gun. Here, dear. Shh, Blackie, shh. Look, Sandy. A hand reaching out from the wall. The letters. 
It's got the letters. Great Scott. Oh, my chubby aunt. Watch it. It's the hand of, of the housekeeper. How do you know? It's got the same ring on she had on this afternoon. If that's not a ghost, I've never seen one. The fire's going out, Sandra. Ah! Sandra! It's all around us! Sandra! Sandra! Oh! against mine. My will is greater. No. Succumb, succumb. My will is greater. No, you're a shadow. And you are a mere mortal who knows no secrets beyond the veil. I control the world of shadows. Succumb, fool. Succumb. No. No, go away. You're nothing but an image. You will die by my command in this house. You will die before morning. Admit my will. No. No, I will not admit your will. Sandra, you're safe now on your own home. Just lie still, darling, and drink this. Oh, Paul. I was a fool to allow you to stay in that accursed place last night. I ought to have my head examined. I came over as soon as I got your message, Paul. Oh, come on in, Jim. Sandra's recovering from a bit of a shock. Yes, I heard about it. I warned you, Paul, that house is definitely haunted. I'm going to board it up. It's completely useless. No, that's not the answer, Jim. It isn't ghosts. At least, not in the real sense of the word. Why, Paul, after what you went through, you say that? It's too malignant for a ghost. Do you believe in the power of hypnotism? Well, I've heard some amazing theories about it anyway. Well, I believe some power controls that house. Well, that's still ghosts. No, because the brain that controls the house is still alive. I'm convinced of it. Well, where do you think this man who controls the house is? He might be thousands of miles away. Remember you said that the eyes in the picture of the fabulous Richards seems alive? Oh, that's ridiculous. Not at all. In some crazy, mad manner, Richards has kept himself alive all these 400 years. In some hypnotic way, he controls that house. Well, if your theory is right, how can we break his control? Well, I'm certain that his control emanates from the little sitting room which once belonged to Mrs. Browning. Yes. Now, if you'll let me... I'd like to hire workmen and tear that room off the rest of the house. Oh, but Paul, well, The room is only an extra addition, Jim. It can't do any harm to try. Okay, pull up more of that flooring. And did you hurt yourself climbing that petition, Sandra? No. Oh, imagine a secret room down here, Paul, right beneath the sitting room. You see, Jim, Paul was right. That's like finding a box with a false bottom. That's all for now, boys. Uh, careful of your head, Sandra. This room isn't very big. But it's as cold as cold storage. Well, now you know how a hunk of beef feels in an icebox. That's gay. <laughs> a musty old room. Bed and four walls. And two drawers built into the wall over there. All modern conveniences. Uh, try to open them. They look rusty. Just pull. All right. Uh, there. The drawer's open. Oh, nothing but a lot of musty old clothes. Listen, Paul. Nothing unusual, Jim. Just the same footfalls we've been hearing all along. I'm beginning to become quite fond of them. Look, here. Why, it's a miniature painting. Yes, a painting of Mr. Richards. Look at it. The same face as that painting in my house. Look at the eyes in the miniature. Paul, they're alive. Great heavens. They're moving. You better put that portrait down, Paul. Yes, they are alive. Living matter in a painting. Oh, Paul, it's getting colder in here all the time. I feel faint. Faint and... Is this something... Unearthly, he's moving around. Open the next drawer, Paul. Hurry, I don't like this growing cold at all. Uh, it won't budge. No, the blasted thing. <laughs> oh, there it is. Why, Paul, there's a thin china saucer full of crystal liquid with a compass floating on it. That's a strange thing. Hmm. There's an inscription written in the drawer. What's it say? As this compass moves, so my will dominates everything within these four walls. Everything dead or alive. Accursed be the house and restless the dwellers therein. What's it mean? This is the brain, Sandra. Oh. Richards controls this instrument through hypnotism. He can control a piece of paper or a chair or even the souls of the dead. Then this house is haunted. Yes, haunted by a malicious, malignant will. It keeps a man's spirit roving restlessly after death. Paul! Paul, look! Look in that corner! Mr. Richards, you... You are alive. Yes, alive. Quite alive. Because I've will to live. Very clever deduction, Mr. Whitney. 
deduction? Yes, I heard your keen analysis of my activities. You are a hypnotist, then? I have been powerful for 400 years. Your blind stumbling onto my secret will not stop me now. I can will anything. I will the specters of the past to re-enter this room. In heaven's name, man, stop this. Oh, that black shadow, it's here with us, closing in. Yes, closing in. All those who have died in this house are my slaves, as you will be my slaves in a very few brief seconds. You are not the brain controlling this house. You gave that power to this compass. You transferred your power to this moving needle. Am I right, Mr. Richards? Put that compass down. Oh, no, I'll destroy it, Mr. Richards. No, you're completely powerless to harm us. Watch out, Paul. This partition's going to crumble. Paul! Sandra! Paul, it's good to be back in our own home. What happened to Mr. Richards when the petition collapsed, Jim? Well, the workmen searched the debris around the house for Mr. Richards' body, but no trace of him was found. I'm afraid that he escaped. Oh, no. You mean he's still alive and free, Jim? Yes, indeed. That's just what I mean. Well, he won't be for long, Sandra. People everywhere will be warned, and every corner of this earth will be looking for him. Even his will can't defy the world, Sandra. No one man can ever fight the world. From the time-worn pages of the past, we have recalled the house and the brain. Bellkeeper, toll the bell. Our next broadcast brings together everything that was good about old-time radio rolled into one. The title itself almost sums up the very essence of what radio drama is all about. Each of the episodes was a microdrama, carefully planned to capture the listener's attention. Over 200 episodes were made, and almost all of them are as good today as they were over half a century ago. For the first few years the series was on air, the announcement at the start of the show varied almost every week, but by the 1950s, it had settled down to be the now-famous... Tired of the everyday grind? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you Escape on Hojo Radio. Stories of Escape. Escape. To get away as by flight. To break away, get free, or get clear from or out of detention, danger, or the like. To avoid or elude a threatened ill. To miss imminent pain, punishment, or misfortune. To issue from confinement or enclosure. Escape. Each week at this time, the National Broadcasting Company presents... Escape. Stories of deliverance from evil. Drama of both fiction and real life. Stories of men and women who, by their own actions, thoughts, and deeds, win their fight to escape. Tonight, Escape from Autumn. The hills were alive with color. From every slope, tapestries of gold and amber... Fiery red and waning greens were bathed in the reflected glory of the setting autumn sun. Old Hank Morton leaned on the sprawling pile of rounded rocks that had once formed a boundary line between his land and that of his neighbor, James Evans. The day was almost over, and the slanting rays of sunlight caught the gray and brown stubble on his face with their glistening light. Old Hank was thinking, and anyone could have told that he didn't much relish his late afternoon thoughts. 
Hank's face was a barometer for his mind. Today, he was worried. Worried as he sensed the end of summer. Thinking, well, it ain't right, that's all. Just don't seem to be right. Of course, I suppose I'm being selfish and all that. But when a man's done all he could, and done pretty well according to most standards, I figure he ought to be able to have some say in a matter as important as this is. It's like a man's own flesh and blood was being taken from him, and it does... Uncle Harry? Uh... Uncle Harry? Yes, what? Just yes. <laughs> Here, now, hold on there, young and Now, hold on. Dick Mason's daddy is back home from war. He's come back for good. Well, now, that must make Dick feel pretty good, huh? Yeah. He was at school today. Dick's father, I mean. Uh-huh. And he talked to us in assembly. It was awfully exciting. All about... Well, was he all right? Er, not hurt, I mean? He had a cane. Limped a little. But he said he'd manage all right. He's a real hero. Gee, Dick's a lucky fella. Well, how do you mean, Penny? Well, his father back home again. Gosh, I wish... Uncle Hank. Yeah? When do you think... I know what you're going to ask me, Penny. Will it be for much longer? Well, I hope not, youngster. You've been a brave boy for a long, long time. I've missed him, Uncle Hank. Well, of course you have. Me too. But nothing we can do about it, is there? Nope. Uncle Hank? Hmm? What's the trouble? Trouble? Oh, what do you mean, Penny? I don't know. You seem so funny. Not like you were all summer, but sort of solemn. Are you mad at me? Oh, heavens, no. <laughs> Whatever gave you that idea, boy? Now you get along with you now before I decide to exercise a little discipline now. I'm going. <laughs> Hurry up with your chores, Uncle Hank. I'm hungry. That night, there was much animated conversation. Penny's first day at school provided more than enough after-supper talk until bedtime came along. And Hank was careful to listen with more than his usual attentiveness, careful to laugh and be gay when the occasion demanded. For Penny was aptly named, bright, alert, and the very echo of Hank's own moods. He had sensed the older man's preoccupation that afternoon in spite of his own excited gaiety. Later, after Penny had said his prayers and then tucked in bed, old Hank had sat up far past his bedtime, rocking gently in the old cherry wood rocker, drawing on a never more than half-lit pipe, thinking, always thinking. My duty towards God and towards my neighbor. To love him as myself, and to do to all men as I would they should do unto me. I wonder if I've done my duty, James, to you, my neighbor. I guess you're James and Ellen Evans, huh? Well, I'm your neighbor, Hank Morton. Oh, we're glad to meet you, sir. Yes. Here, now. None of that sure stuff. We're going to be neighbors, not distant acquaintances. Oh, well, sorry. I, I didn't mean you to. You see, Hank, we're newlyweds. Yeah, I know you are. And I don't aim to butt in, neither. But I just had to say hello and welcome you to our hills. I'm a bachelor myself, but if there's anything you need or want, just ask me. I've lived all my life here, and I love it. And I want you folks to love your new home as much as I do. That's all. Thank you, Hank. I know we shall. And you're going to be our very first friend. Yes, sir. Or, I mean, uh, Hank. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and thanks for greeting us like this. I, it's, oh, it's swell. But, Hank, darling, you shouldn't have done that. Uh, why not? You've been keeping me and butter and eggs for weeks. What's a few logs of wood? A back-breaking chore. Oh, not for me. That's how I keep limber these days. 
When the time comes that I can't split a cord of wood, <laughs> well, I'll know that I'm done for. Oh, you're a dear. Tell you what, first fire we make, you're going to share it with us. <laughs> uh, I hoped you'd say that, Ellen. I was aiming for an invitation. <laughs> and I'm going to accept. Oh, well, that is if... You're sure James would be too jealous. Oh, Hank. <laughs> You're wonderful. <laughs> Looks like this is the real thing, Hank. Well, she's being a real fighter, James. I, I'd better see if I can't get a hold of Dr. Moss. Well, you'll do nothing to the sort. The wires are down to the count of the storm. I've already tried to reach up my phone. Oh. Well, then I'll have to go no, on. No, you'll stay here with Ellen. She needs you. I'll go into town and bring him out with me. But the roads are icy, Hank, and, and there may be drifts, but with all this wind... I and... know my way into town and out backers, James. Now, you keep Ellen warm. And get some water on the boil, and I'll be back with Doc just as soon as possible. I... I don't know what to say, Hank, or how to thank well, you. don't thank me yet. Just hope I get back in time. But, James... Yeah? Tell Ellen I love her, too. Tell her to keep her chin up. Thank God. In time. James. Is it a boy or... or, or... It's all over. A boy. Here. Sit down. You look as though you... You needed a doctor. A boy, huh? It's all over. A boy. And Ellen. <laughs> James. Is she all right? Is Ellen all right? It's all over. For Ellen. She's dead. Why, God? Tell me why. Slowly... Hank Morton tapped out his pipe, rose from the rocker, turned out the light, and carefully made his way to bed. He shivered as he quickly undressed in the chill autumn night. It was getting old, he reflected. If only he could stop thinking about James and Ellen, gone so soon, long before her time, and Penny, but mostly about James, his neighbor. Oh, sure, I could appeal it, of course, Hank, but I couldn't do that, not and stay honest with myself. Well, I know how you feel, yes. Ah, I wish I was a little younger, that's all. Oh, you did your share in the last scrap. Now, it's my turn now, and I don't mean to skip it. Well, you have to be true to yourself, James. If you believe in what you're going to do, go ahead and do it. But what about Penny? Well, if he were any older, I'd fight to stay home and bring him up right, but... Well, he's just a kid, and maybe this won't mean too much heartache now. Well, uh, Penny's got a lot of spring and bouts. Uh, don't you worry about him, James. Besides, I, I... Uh, I wanted to talk to you about that, Hank. It, uh, it doesn't seem right that you should be burdening burdening yourself with bringing up a youngster while I'm in service. Oh, don't seem right, eh? And who could do it any better? Oh, whoa. <laughs> no, I didn't mean Well, that. who's been teaching them to fish and heist to sail in the sound? Who's been giving him little odds and ends of chores so that he can make himself useful around the place, huh? Well, I'm sorry, Hank. I'm not ungrateful. I... Well, I only wanted you to know You'll that send I... that boy to any relatives and I'll... Uh... Uh... Oh, heck. I don't know what I'll do. Besides, maybe I'm being presumptuous, James. But I think Ellen would want him to grow up here, right at home. Where he first saw daylight. Ah, you've made me very happy, Hank. I know what Ellen would have wanted. Now that I know you want it that way, too, that's how it'll be. Thank God for you, neighbor. The dawn came all too soon. Carrying in its wake a tingling scent of upstate mountaintops and a hint of frosts to come... 
Both Penny and Hank woke early, did their chores briskly, and sat down to a steaming hot New England breakfast. Mmm, swell elegant. Yeah. Well, a grown body needs plenty of food. It's got to be good food, or else you wouldn't have no use for it, huh? You're growing too, Uncle Hank, aren't you? <laughs> well, I reckon so, Penny. Yeah, just like an old oak tree. <laughs> an oak tree? <laughs> sure. Or a maple, or elm. Well, any kind of tree you want, Nate. Oh, you're kidding, Uncle oh, Hank. Oh, no, sir. Bob, I'm not. No. How does it feel to be as old as you are? <laughs> Do you really think I'm old? Well, not exactly. But you're lots older than I am. Yeah, 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 I reckon I am. Well, but that don't make us any less friends, does it? No, sirree. Next to my daddy, you're the only person I really like. But tell me, how does it feel to be... Well, you know... Well, like I told you, young and like a tree must feel... Yeah, when you're young, like you, you feel like a sapling. Your roots ain't so long, and they don't go so deep into the soil. But they're deep enough so as you can get nourishment, all the things you need for living out of the soil. And you bend in the wind. And if you're not too careful, the hot sun or the cold frost will blight you. It'll make you wither away before your time. Yeah. <laughs> That's how you feel when you're in the spring of life. Then comes summer. Your leaves fill out and they become a handsome green. Ah. A tree in summertime is something like your daddy James. A grown man. Gosh, Uncle Hank. I never thought... Gee. Yeah. And it comes out of Penny. Your roots are firm and deep, embedded and twisted in the earth. You still get life and nourishment, but the time comes when life is drained out of your veins. The sun grows cooler. The winds are chill. And even though your bark is thick and hard, you feel the change. But trees are pretty in autumn. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're right, Penny. Yes. There is a beauty that comes with age. Yeah. Sort of a last-ditch fight that you put up before you know that old winter will get you. Makes a swell show for a while. And then... And then... Yes, Uncle Hank? Then comes winter. Go on. Tell me what it feels like. <laughs> no, no. I couldn't if I wanted to. <laughs> I'm not that old. Besides, you're going to have to step brisk pace if you're intended to get to school before that old school bell rings. <laughs> Go on out. Along with it. Go on. The sun was rising higher in the heavens. Outside was peace, contentment, and rich fulfillment in harvest. But inside the house, it was much darker. Penny had gone to school. Old Hank sat quietly at the breakfast table, thinking again. His gnarled fingers reached into one of the pockets of the tattered old vest, which he seldom went without. They clutched a crumpled piece of paper, well read. Only a few days old. But so well memorized he could almost hear the words coming from James' lips. Old neighbor, I don't know how to tell you this in words. All the gratitude I've stored up for years just won't seem to flow into sentences and grammatical construction. I wish I could express all the warm things I feel in my heart for you and what you've done for Penny and me. But I can't. And that brings me to a rather painful subject, Hank. The story of me. A story that has an ending. 
You see, old friend, I've been banged up a bit. And I won't be coming home. The medics don't give me much longer. A week or so, that's all. Nothing I can do about it. I fought. I'm still fighting. But some things must take their course. Just like the rivers which end up in the sea. No matter how, how their course, their course may be changed, they make their way to their everlasting home. It's my turn now. Promise me you'll tell Penny when the telegram comes. Maybe I've done you wrong by telling you this now, but somehow I feel that you should know first. We'll give you a chance to think over what and how to tell the youngster. Goodbye, Hank. I'll leave you with many burdens. More than you deserve to be laid with. Maybe they be light for your shoulders. Your loving friend and neighbor. James. Yeah, fine day. Fine out of day, huh? Yep, couldn't be better. Oh, yeah. Hank, I, I've got a... Uh, got a wire for me? Afraid I have. Came ringing out from town. So it's come at last. Too soon. Ain't you going to open it? Huh? Uh, oh, well, no, Elmer. Not, not yet a while, though. No. I know what it says. I'm sorry. Awful sorry, Hank. Yeah, me too. James was a fine man. You, you ain't going to tell the youngster for a while, are you? Not tell Penny? He's pretty young. You, you wouldn't want to hurt him more than necessary. Well, you're wrong about that, Elmer. I am going to tell him. But, Hank, it ain't... It wouldn't be fair not to. Neither to James nor to Penny. You think it's wise, Hank? It's the only thing to do, Elmer. Thing is, well, how to do it? You're awful solemn again, Uncle Hank. Oh, am I, Penny? Yeah. Please, I wish there was something I could do to make you cheer up. Oh, there now, I'm sorry, youngin. It's the coming of winter, I guess. Hey, that reminds me, too. Uh, never did finish that story of mine about growing old like a tree, did I? Nope. Well, I guess I will now. Yeah. You see, Penny, there are times when my story don't hold good. You see, sometimes a man has more than one job to do here on Earth. Maybe two big jobs. He finishes one. And God says, that's enough. The man's done his share. Maybe the other job is left undone. But there's always someone else to tend to it as part of his old job. Sometimes, too, the forest gets all overcrowded. Some trees die so that others can reach the light. Grow, live. That's the thing about winter, Penny. Sometimes it comes in a man's prime. I understand. Do you, boy? Are you sure? Yes, Uncle Hank. A telegram came today. What? Where from? Who sent it? Here, young. I have it open. Maybe you'd better do it for me. All right. The War Department regrets. Oh, Uncle Hank. It's Daddy. James. He's gone. Yes, yes, yes. You see, it's like I was telling you. 
Sometimes a man's job is done at his prime. Sometimes, when he goes, a little more light and sun shines on those of us left behind. A little more life for us. For a moment, for a moment, nothing more was said. Then, Penny stood up, walked to the door, and went out into the autumn night. Old Hank made as if to follow him, and then thought better of it. A young man's grief is a solitary thing. There'd be time to share it, and to forget it. Hank busied himself about the house, tidying up the supper dishes, putting another log or two on the cheerful fire. He knew Penny would be all right. And now, for the first time in many months, he felt younger. His new burdens had overthrown the nagging load of the autumn of old age. Hank looked up at the autumn sky. Then he went inside, closed the door, and sat by the fire, waiting for Penny. You have heard Escape from Autumn, written by Alan M. Fishburn and directed by Norman Felton. The National Broadcasting Company has presented another story of Escape. Cliff Subir was heard as Hank, Leonard Smith as Penny, Ralph Camargo played James. Your narrator is Cleve Kirby. And same station, NBC will bring you Escape from Royalty. This is the National Broadcasting Company. You're listening to Hojo Radio. Stay tuned. beyond the horizons of the mind to yesterday and tomorrow. CBS and its affiliated stations present Escape. Tonight we escape with Rudyard Kipling and the two gentle scoundrels he created in his immortal story, The Man Who Would Be King. The time, sometime before yesterday. The place, the north of India. The man who tells the story, Rudyard Kipling. One Saturday night, it was my unpleasant duty to put the paper to bed alone. It was a pitchy black night, as stifling as night can be in India in June. It was very still, save for the ticking of the clock above my desk, which seemed to shatter the black heat of the night as the hands crept toward 3 a.m. And then from the passage outside my door, I heard voices. You like them. And it would be here. Open the door. Who's there? It's only us. Who are you? Oh, oh, oh. He don't remember us, Dan. <laughs> that he don't. How could he forget having us turn back at the John Paul border? Told the authorities we was impersonating newspaper reporters, he did. Wait. That flaming red beard and that bald head. Why... Well, you're Daniel Dravitt and Peachy Carnahan. The same. Well, what do you want? If it's money, I haven't any. If it's a fight, it's simply too beastly hot. You can rest yourself easy, sir, because we've come asking for naught except some information. We've been all over this country, and we've concluded that India isn't big enough for such as Daniel and me. So we're going away to be kings. Kings in our own divine right. What? I, we shall be kings. We've signed a solemn contract. Each day up the other, and neither of us will take a look at liquor 
all women until we become king. What? I've never heard of such a fantastic idea. But what is it you want of me? No, it's not to look at such maps of Kafiristan as you might have about. Maps of Kafiristan? That's where we've decided to go. But don't you realize that not one single Englishman has ever gone into the Kafiristan mountains and lived to come out again? If you're really mad enough to go there, you're a good deal more likely to become dead men than kings. We shall see. Anyway, I don't believe you had the slightest intention of traveling a mile outside of Delhi. Then you should come down to the Serai marketplace in the morning. Down where the caravans leave for the north. Yes, come down to the Serai in the morning and see then if we be liars. on the wall here. The blessings of Pir Khan on the base of Sahib, who consents to look at the poor toys of a priest from Ajmer. Over this way. Where's Carnahan? Here we are. Permit me to present my servant, Hazir Mir Khan. At your service, good man. Well, I'll be... <laughs> Did you like our disguises? Do they pass? If they fool this crowd in the Serai, they're probably good enough to get you across the border. And good enough to get you killed. Getting killed is no part of the contract Peachy and me drawed up. Although perhaps killing fits in with our plans in a different sense. Feel around underneath the toys there in the camel bags. What? Go ahead. Good Lord. Rifle. Twenty brand new martinis. With ammunition to match. And twenty good reasons to make your death certain. Any patient of the hill tribes would kill his own mother to get a rifle. Now who would harm a poor mad priest, Sahib? <laughs> Allah protects me. Mad is right. Then so was Lord Clive and Rhodes and Bonaparte. Drive out the camels, Peachy. We've a long way to go before we become king. Oh, hey, hop. As I stood and listened to the camel bells fade away in the distance, I wondered. Wondered if it might not be a glorious thing to go to Tafiristan and be a king. pass in India much as they pass in any other land. It grows up. Then the rains come, and then the heat again. Some colonel at a hill station puts down an uprising. A new viceroy comes out from London, and the paper duly records the death of a sultan in Rajputana, and the trees in the courtyard grow a few feet taller. Finally, time in its circle turned up another night, much like the one three years before. Once again, I sat alone in the office, listening to the clock and waiting for some unimportant item to come over the wire from Europe. It was long after midnight when my office door slowly opened. I say, look here, you, you might knock first, you know. No. No. Good Lord, man. What's wrong? I... Uh... You don't know who I am, do you? No. No, I haven't the faintest idea. But here, you'd better sit down, old fellow. You're in a bad way. This banjo. It's a whole year I've been walking. Right here in this very office we settled it. You sitting right there and giving us the map. <laughs> you, you've been sitting there ever since three years. No. Oh, no. Why, a man couldn't change that much in three years. You're not Pitchy Carnahan. Yes. I was king of Tafiristan. 
Me and Daniel Dravid. Real crown kings we was. Just as true as gospel. What in the name of heaven have they done to you, Peachy? Peachy? I, I knew Peachy Connor and what? He's a king. Where's the real golden crown on his head? Oh, he does. He, he's dead now, though. No, no, no. You're, you're Peachy Carnahan. You must pull yourself together, man. Yes, yes. Pull myself. You, you've got to keep looking into my eyes. And maybe everything will go to pieces. All right. Now, tell me what happened, Peachy. We left the caravan at Jagdala. We struck off into the hills alone. Go on. Which it was we traveled, Daniel and me. First there was an no old road. After a while, no food. But there was always the drum. Sometimes there was ghosts. Sometimes farther off. But most of the time we could hear them somewhere. to be stopping up with you. I'm fearing it's no use, Daniel. What's got into them? The poor beasts are done in and starved, same as ourselves. They'll go no further. Then we'll go on without them. I've not come this far to die on the side of a mountain. Wait. Look, Daniel. Over the edge of the rocks. What? Oh, men they are. There'll be a score or more of them. One goes ahead of the rest. And no, but bows and arrows. Break out a pair of the rifles, Peachy. I try, Daniel. Now that we start to become king. Here, here. Some cartridges, too. Easy now, Peachy. I'll drop the straggler at the rear first, and then we'll lay a few at their feet. Now on to the one in front. We may need him. Now. <laughs> Look at them. I flat on their blooming faces. The leader is come out alone. Well and good, and we'll go part way to meet him, Peachy. But keep your rifle by. Look at him, Daniel. He be as fair as us, with yellow hair. So he does. Part of the lost tribe, these people are. He stopped. I await your command, for he who speaks in the voice of thunder. Oh, the Lord, Harry. Peachy, we're in luck. It's the old Afghan tongue he speaks. Speak up. Who are you, and whence do you come? I am high priest and the chief of the village of Bastai. A journey of only a few heartbeats. This Bastai, how many people? They are numbered in the thousands. There are more villages in the hills. More than a man has fingers and toes. Hear that, Peachy? Here's our kingdom made to order. And you, you're going to take us to Bastai. Do you understand? I understand the voice of thunder that you speak. Oh, he's a smooth one, Peachy. He knows a thing or two. <laughs> What's your name? Madrul Panjagalut. That's too long. What do you call him, Peachy? He has a look about him of an old soldier and friend of ours. Billy Fish. So he does. We bestow a new name on you. From now on, you will be Billy Fish. As you command, I obey. All right. Put this on your drums. <coughs> Tell them two kings have come out from the mountain top. Two kings that speak in words of thunder so the earth trembles. Tell them two kings have come to Kafiristan. <laughs> Why be you sitting here in the dark? I've been thinking. A man has to stop and think sometimes. About anything special, Marion? Look at them, Peachy. Look at their blinking campfires are gleaming in the dark like the jewels in a crown. Aye, Daniel. You've done a fine job for sure. All 23 villages you joined together as one. It is the army you trained to be thanked for it. 2,000 men with a fair knowledge of bearing arms. Some's a bit green at it yet. Not ours now. Every man, jack, woman, and child. We own them, body and soul. Aye, we're kings now, Daniel. Not proper kings yet, but we will be. 
sooner than you think, Peachy. How's that? Billy Fish told me something today that fair amazed me. These people know the craft. You mean they're Freemasons, Dundee? Oh, it ain't no wise possible. They wrote me his gospel true. He give me the grip and everything. It's old, the craft is older than the memory of man. And up here in the hills, they've been preserving it all these years. Why, some of the high priests know up through the fellow craft. But they don't know the third degree. See it, Peachy? They don't know the third degree. But we do. Daniel, what is it you're fixing to do? Do? We're going to be proper kings. We're going to get them going and coming now. I'm going to turn the whole country into one grand lodge. Raise some of the priests to third degree. And for me, I'll be the grand master of Kafiristan. Oh, but you ain't got the right to. We've never been officers in no lodge. Right. What's the king got to do with asking for a right? Oh, I'm against it, Daniel. It's no good to go fooling around with the crap. Ah, you talk like an old woman. The thing will work. I know it will. We'll make it a blooming ceremony. Regular aprons with a symbol and the marks. All of us, Peachy. The kings of Kafiristan. priests and the people wait. Well, they don't have to wait much longer, Billy. Here now, Peachy. How do you like my apron? It's a wonder. Right up there, Daniel. Made of white ermine skin it is. And the master's mark with emerald studded. The mark. You know the meaning of the mark? That I do. What's got into you, Billy? Not. Tis a thing that's passing strange, Master. Strange and rubbish. Come along now. Ready, Peachy? Right with you, Daniel. Then out we go. On to the temple steps. We'll give them what for. Knock their blinking eyes out. That's what we'll do. with the priest, Billy. It looks like trouble, Daniel. Oh, stand where you are, master. They recognize the mark. That great stone in the floor. Why do they turn it over? Wait. It's the sign! It's the mark! You promised me! Oh, Speak up, Billy Fish. What's the meaning of it? See for yourself. Look, Daniel. Carved on the back of the stone. Is the master's mark all right? And the same as the sign you wear. Only a few of the priests have known of the hidden mark on the stone. What does it mean? The many who have doubted you were a god. Doubt no longer. And you, Billy? What do you think? I, master. I think that now it is the time for thee. Daniel! Golden crowns! Aye, how they glitter. Fit for the brow of a king. Tis what we came for. Here now, put them on. We'll crown ourselves in our own right. Gods you became as well as kings. But then, what happened? What became of Daniel's draft? Dravot. I knew Daniel Dravot once. He's a king now who Daniel is. Where's the golden crown? Carnahan was with him. Peachy, try to pull yourself together. I, I'll try. Now, you became king, you and Daniel. Kings of all Kafiristan. He was a fine figure, Daniel was, with his red head wearing that golden crown. Kept himself aloof from the people, so to speak. And when he walked before the temple, 
The bear crawled on their stomach to worship them. But what happened, man? Happened? Well, I figure mostly it was winter coming on. The winds were starting up, and the clouds were blowing down from the north. Oh, come blow, beastly cold, that winter wind. Hey, who's out there? That you, Billy? Confound it anyway. Here now, what's this? Oh, oh bless you, first, master. You were so wise, to carry and life. Up off your knees, girl. Bring it inside. Thank you, master. Uh, Flush it there. Hmm. Now, you're a well-favored wench. I do not understand. Why were you crawling on your knees? It's a fitting way to approach the god of Kafiristan. What's your name, girl? Maruma Benja. Maruma? You married? It, it has not yet been my happy fortune, master. Are you afraid of me? You are a god. I mean, how do I seem to you? Do you find me pleasing or, or what? For faith. More wondrous than the noonday sun. And your look. A look of eagle. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, very well, you may leave now. Thank you, Master. Hmm. Narrow, eh? Peachy! Peachy! Did you call in me, Daniel? Oh, the food here, eh? Good. Knock that window outside. Winter's about you to strike and fill the trails with snow. There'll be little moving about before spring. But you are. Peachy, I've decided to take a wife. But you can't do it, Daniel. We made a contract. That was till we was kings. Well, kings we've been many months now. Oh, but it's no good. I tell you now, I, I'm against you. Against it? You was against using the craft too. But look what it done for us. Oh, but this is different. Billy Fish will tell you no, too. It's the same as I do. Billy Fish, huh? Who's the king here, him or me? My mind's made up. Three days from now, I shall have me a wife. And you can put it on the drums and tell every blighter out there in the hills. The kingdom of Kafiristan is going to have a queen. They should have brought her in here half an hour ago. I don't know, Daniel. How about you, Billy Fish? You put them up to stalling off deliberate like? Certain preparations must be made, Master. She's across the court with some of the priests. Maybe they're trying to hearten her up a bit, Daniel. She thinks she's going to die, you know. Die, indeed. Why, I'm only... Master, it is against the laws of heaven for a woman to marry a god. I'm not a god. I'm a man. You know that by now, Billy. No. And I should not want to think so, Master. But either way, this can mean only trouble. I beg you to reconsider. And I beg you to shut up, Billy. I'm through waiting. I'm going over there. Master, please. We've got to go with him, Billy. And I'm thinking it's going to mean trouble. How many men can you defend, depend on? No more than 20 with rifles. Most of my men are in Bashkai. Then what shall we do? We shall have to make a run for it, I fear. We might be safe in Bashkai. Come on now, you fucking fools. Bring out the girl. Well, that's better. Here, girl, this is no way for a bride to behave. A smile now. And give us a kiss. Oh! The wench is bitten me. Don't let them see the blood. See the blood! Come back, 
and beat their blasted heads in. That's what I'll do. Oh, Daniel, we'll be back all right. How much further, Billy? Oh, only a short way beyond this bridge, Master. Well, so far, so good. Ah, last of them blooming drums are set off. We're at the top, Daniel. The right good climbing. Oh, wait. Look. It seems the drums have come before us, Master. Cut off. No less than a thousand of them standing there quiet like. With them wicked long knives in their hands. There'll be no getting past them, Daniel. No. We are done for. Go back, Billy Fish, and take your men away with you. Go with him, Peachy. It's me they want. I did it. Me, the king. No, Dan. I'm sticking with you. Billy Fish, you clear out. I am your friend. I stay with you. You're a good man, Billy. I'll be coming now, Daniel. Peachy. Let it, Daniel, I forgive you freely and fully. Then let them come. There'll be one thing they can't change, Peachy. We've been kings. Kings in our own life. Kings of all popularity. Did I get away from them? They had us for fair, all right. Struck me out on that tree. Drove nails right through my hands. They did. See? But I pulled them all right. Because morning came. I wasn't no wise dead. Then I made them think I'd lost my sense. <laughs> I was afraid to harm me because I was protected by Allah. They cut me down then, and after a while, they let me go. You poor devil. But what of that? What happened to Daniel? Daniel. Daniel is the king. He wears the golden crown. But now, what happened to him? He's never left me. All them long months walking on the road back kept me safe. The mountains, they danced at night. But Daniel held up his hands and Peachy came along, bent double. I never let go of Daniel's hand. That Daniel's hand that they gave me in the temple as a present. It's with me now. Here. In this bundle. You knew old Daniel's. Him that was a monarch once. Look at him now. I let him go. There was little else to do. He was only hours away from his death. I sat there and stared at the bundle he had left lying on my desk. Stared as the pale shafts of dawn struck fire in the red beard. 
stared at the golden crown, sitting too large and heavy upon the wrinkled, mummified head of Daniel Dravot, the man who would be king. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson. Tonight's story, Rudyard Kipling is the man who would be king, was adapted for radio by Les Crutchfield and featured Raymond Lawrence as Peachy, Eric Snowden as Dan Rabbit, and Herbert Robinson as Kipling. Musical effects were created and conducted by Cy Fewer. Next week, CBS and its affiliated stations invite you to escape in Operation Florida de Lee, an episode from the files of the OSS. And so, good night. Until a week from tonight, when again we invite you to escape. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Our next broadcast is a radio mystery drama which ran from May 16th, 1942 until September 27th, 1955 on CBS Radio Network. The show was also broadcast in Chicago and over Armed Forces Radio. On the West Coast, it was sponsored by the Signal Oil Company. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program. The program was also adapted into a film noir series by Columbia Pictures in 1944. Each episode began with the sound of footsteps and a person whistling. The haunting signature theme tune was composed by Wilbert Hatch and featured Dorothy Roberts whistling with an orchestra. We present to you The Whistler on Hojo Radio. Have you heard the strange tales of The Whistler? I may be the district attorney, but if my son is guilty, he can pay the penalty like anyone else. I'll prosecute him. Then, Blake, I'll start on you. Sunday night, and again, CBS presents The Whistler. I, the whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. And so I tell you tonight the unusual story of the weakling. Young Clyde Banning, son of District Attorney Banning, steps out of a nightclub following a gay New Year's Eve party. An expensive limousine pulls up to the curb and Clyde gets in. Clyde has done some careless driving lately, had his driver's license revoked, and is now forced to be driven about by Rawlins, the family chauffeur. Where to now, Mr. Benning? Let's go home, Rolling. Not yet, Clyde. Hey, look. What are you doing in here? I thought you were still in the club. I didn't think you even knew I was there. Oh, I saw you a couple of times. Why have you been avoiding me, Clyde? You know how it hurts me. What's happened? Take Miss Blake home, Rolling. No, I won't go home. I won't be brushed off like this without an explanation. You know how much I love you, Clyde, and I, I can't go on like this any longer. Please, this is no time to make a scene. Clyde, you know you love me. Let's get married right now, tonight. Please, let's not talk about it now. I will talk about it now. Rollins, pull up, please. I won't get out, Clive. I won't. I'll drive, Rollins. You can take a cab home. You'll drive, but listen Go on, here. Rollins. I'll take Miss Blake home. Don't take me home, Clive. I- I've got to talk to you. Please, drive down to the Ocean Highway. All right. All right, but cut out the melodrama. Why have you changed so, Clyde? Why can't we get married? You know as well as I. My father is district attorney and he's out to crack that graft situation wide open. 
He knows who the big boss of the racket is, and he's going to get his scalp. Send him to the pen. But what's that to do with us? You know that Jim Blake is the big boss. Your own father. But we have our own lives to live. If I married you, Dad would throw me out of my ear. What, if Dad, we could get along? How? Your father won't have a dime in the silver. Besides, Dad is up for re-election. How would it look? D.A.'s son marries convict's daughter. I... I thought you really loved me. But I've always liked you, Ellen, but it just won't work. It isn't fair to Dad. Then you don't want to marry me? I've told you how I feel about it. <laughs> what a ridiculous fool I've been. Now, don't stop that hysterical stuff I've again. hoped against hope that you weren't trying to get rid of me, but now I know. You're a low, spineless jellyfish. You didn't love me. You could not. Stop shouting. I won't stop. I wish everyone could hear me. Could know what a despicable robber you Shut are. Shut up. <laughs> no stop it, you fool. Ellen! Good Lord. Ellen. 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 Oh, Lord. Her fate. Ellen. Ellen, darling. Better get a doctor. Maybe she... No, shouldn't move her. Yes, that's it. Get help. Yes, Clyde. Better get help. There, just ahead, the low lights of the service station. Hurry, Clyde. Maybe she's still alive. What's the trouble, Clyde? You're slowing down. Well, they, they might think I did it. Think I pushed her out. She's dead. She must be. No one knows. Better drive on. You've passed it now, Clyde. You've really fixed things now. You should have stopped. Clyde's fear increases with every mile. He slips the car into the garage and hurries quietly to his room. But he doesn't sleep, not a wink. His head throbs, and with every thump of his heart, Ellen's words ring in his ears. District Attorney Banning sits at breakfast with his attractive wife, Marsha. Marsha is Clyde's stepmother. The district attorney scans his morning paper as Clyde, pale and worn, slips into his place at the table. Hmm. What do you think of that? What is it, Henry? Jim Blake's daughter was found dead on the Ocean Highway early this morning. Oh, they found her on the Ocean Highway? Oh, good morning, son. Where have you been? Oh, I guess I overslept. Really? Really? <laughs> Looks as though you hadn't slept at all. Have a big evening. Too much champagne? No, no. Gee, that's terrible about Blake's daughter. What happened to her? I think she was thrown out of a car. Probably some enemy of Blake's. I dare say he has plenty. Thrown out? Does it say that? Yes. Well, I'd better go down to the office. Maybe she jumped out. Not likely. Venture to say she was pushed out all right. Why don't you have some coffee, Clyde? Help that hangover. I haven't got a hangover. (laughs) What in the name of heaven's wrong with you? You better take some aspirin, son, and go back to bed. Well, you're going to the office today? It's New Year's Day. Never go down there on a holiday. Going down for an hour or so. Will it upset your plans by any chance? I haven't got any plans. And what's bothering you? Something's wrong with you, Clyde. Nothing's wrong with me, and nothing bothers Just a moment. Who are you shouting what? at? I'm not shouting at I think you'd better go on back to your room and go to bed. You're a bit too unpleasant to suit me. I'm sorry. Sorry, Marsha. That's all right, darling. I'll feel all right after a while, I... Because I did have too much champagne. Never seen Clyde like this. Well, you've only been around him a year, Marcia. He's a moody type, has spells, but he's a good boy. You'll learn all his little quirks in time. Well, I'll run along, darling. Be back in an hour or so. I beg your pardon, Mr. Clyde. Yes? What is it, Thompson? Rawlings, the chauffeur. I would like to see you, sir. Oh, yes? All right, send him in. He'll see you, Rawlings. What do you want, Rawlings? I'd like to have a little talk with you, Klein. Yeah? What's on your mind? Uh, Where did you go last night after you dismissed me? What business is that of yours? Well, I just thought I'd ask you. Got in around 2.30, didn't you, Klein? What of it? Thought maybe you knew what happened to Ellen Blake. 
I took her home. What happened after that, I don't know. She kind of put the pressure on you, didn't she? What do you mean? I heard her. Heard every word you both said. She, uh, she said she was determined to get married. So what? Well, it wouldn't be so good for you if I was to tell about last night. No? Oh, you made a big mistake when you let me out of that car. If you let me drive her home, why, you might not be in this jam. Who said I was in a jam? I say so. What? What if you do tell what you know? That doesn't prove anything. Oh, I got better proof than that. What? Helen Blake's handbag. I found it in the car this morning. Here it is. What? Her initials on it. Some personal effects inside. Oh, yeah? Now, I'm the only one who knows about all this. If I talk, you're certain to get a rope around your neck. I didn't kill her. She, she jumped out. Yeah. Can you prove that? No. If I tell about the argument and establish the time, you wouldn't have a chance. I didn't kill her, I tell you. How'd you like trying convincing a jury on that? No. Well. But you know, I don't have to say a word about it, Clyde. Why should you? It all depends on you. What do you want? Oh, I could use a little money. How much? Uh, two or three thousand dollars. What? Where would I get that much? You get a nice allowance every month. Huh? You're a dirty rat, Rollins. I didn't like your looks when you came here three weeks ago. I thought you looked like a crook. I'll have you fired. I don't think you will. You can't afford to. Do I get the handbag? No. Not until you pay off in full. Suppose I tell you to go to the dead. And you'll be in jail within an hour. I mean business. Okay. Okay, I'll pay as much as I can each month. I don't want to wait too long. I'll try to get it as soon as possible. I want that handbag. You'll get it, kid. When I get the 3000 Good afternoon, madame. What, what do you mean, coming into my room without knocking? And how is madame today? What do you want? I want to wish you a happy new year. Well, of all the nerve... You get out now, of here. Now, 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 don't get excited. I thought you might like to talk to me. What do you mean? Well, I've got a little information that uh, might be of interest to you. Information? What are you talking about? I'm talking about Clyde. What about him? Well, I was just wondering what would happen if your husband had to prosecute his own son for the uh, <clears throat> murder of the daughter of the man he's out to break. Are you crazy? What do you mean? Clyde murdered Ellen Blake. Throw her out of the car. What? How do you know that? She was in love with Clyde. He was trying to shake her. I drove them away from a nightclub last evening. They had a very serious argument. And then he let me out and drove the car himself. That doesn't mean anything. Ellen Blake was killed about 1 a.m. Clyde came in about 2. Good heavens. This morning I found his handbag in the car. It's Ellen Blake's. If I were to tell what I know about it and produce his handbag, Clyde would have a rope placed around his neck by his own father. I doubt very much that the D.A. would ever be reelected. How could Clyde do such a thing? I mean, he lost his head. She was pretty insistent. But you don't have to say anything about this. Oh, I... I wouldn't have to. If this came out, Henry would be ruined. That's just what I mean. Now, you wouldn't want that to happen, would you? No. Then it's all up to you. Up to me? Yes, if I cover up a murder, it might affect my conscience. I might worry a lot. But uh, my conscience might be sad. What do you want? Well, it ought to be worth about $3,000. Three? Why, that's ridiculous. I have no such amount. Then get it. How could I explain what I wanted with $3,000? That's your worry, not mine, baby. Do you know what they can do to you for blackmail? No, no, this isn't blackmail, honey. No, I'm not threatening to divorce someone's past. It's bigger than that. As a matter of fact, you're going to bribe me to withhold a piece of important evidence. So you see, I hold the aces. Get out of here. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> okay. But I know somebody who has a lot of dough, and I'd just as soon turn the information over to Blake as anyone else. I just want to give you a break. How about this diamond bracelet? Oh. Yeah, that'll help. But it'll be hard to get rid of. I'd, I'd rather have cash. All right, I'll give you these diamonds and you can hold them until I get the cash. Fair enough. Hand them over. Thanks. You know, I thought I'd... Well, that you'd see things in the right way. Goodbye, honey. Get out of here. <laughs> you rotten thief. Oh, listen to her. <laughs> 
days pass, Clyde and Marsha are both turning over every cent they can get hold of to Rollins. But the going is difficult, and Rollins becomes more insistent. Then one day, Clyde gets a message to visit the big boss, Jim Blake, Ellen's father. I... I was told you wanted to see me, Mr. Blake. Yeah. Sit down, kid. Thank you. Everything working out all right? What do you mean? You look a little worried, kid. I thought maybe something was disturbing your sleep. Oh, well, I've been having headaches. I think it's my eyes. Been seeing things, have you? In the dark? No, I haven't been seeing things. I don't know what you're getting at, but nothing's bothering me. Just when was it that you started meeting my daughter, Ellen? I don't know what you mean. Ah, quit playing dumb. I found out about it today. Who told you such a thing? Does your father know about you and Ellen? I'll bet not. Now, look here. If you think you can stop father in this investigation by trying to frame something on me, you're crazy. You can't get away with it. I'll spill the whole thing. Oh, you will? Yes, I will. You're a crook. When my father gets through with you, you'll be behind the bars for the rest of your life. When I'm put behind bars, kids, you'll be dangling from the end of a rope. What? What are you trying to accuse me of? The murder of my daughter. Murder? I didn't kill her. Can you prove that? There's no proof that I did. I've got a witness, kid, and he's ready to talk when I say the word. Witness? That's ridiculous. Why should I want to kill Ellen? Because she was in love with you, and you wanted to shake her because you were afraid your father would kick if you married her. Your father's out to get me, and I'm determined to beat him to the draw. I didn't kill her, I tell you. Ellen left that nightclub with your car New Year's Eve. You had an argument. She wanted to get married. When she got too insistent, you dismissed the chauffeur and drove the car yourself. And out on the ocean highway, you threw her out on the rocks. I didn't, I didn't. Did you stop? Did you look at her? Her face mangled to a pulp. Her body broken to bits on those rocks. I didn't do it. I swear I didn't. I've got a witness to the argument and the time element. You you can't scare me. I just talked to Rollins, your chauffeur. He knows what time you got in, and he found Ellen's purse in the car. I, I don't believe it. Where's the purse? Rollins has it. He'll produce it when you get to trial. And your own father will have to prosecute you. Oh, I'll enjoy that. Too bad about that purse, kid. If you'd found the purse and Rawlins didn't know what he knows, you might have gotten away with it. But you're stuck now, stuck with Rawlins and the purse, and your own father will have to tie the rope around your neck. Rawlins is a liar. It'll hold in court. The jury will believe him. He's a dirty liar. I could kill him. Kill him? You you wouldn't do that. Well, he isn't fit to live. Well, you aren't either. But I'm going to give you a chance to keep out of the noose. I'll keep Rawlins from talking if you get me a couple of letters. Well, what letters? Your father has them. They have my signature on them. You can get them very easily. You get those papers and I'll put the quietus on Rollins. They're addressed to the county supervisor. Your father intends to use them against me. I want them. Is that clear? Yeah. You get the papers and we're both in the clear. Understand? Yeah, you understand. All right. I'll give you till tomorrow evening at six o'clock. You can go now. Yeah. Remember, six o'clock tomorrow night. <laughs> Saturday night passes. Then Sunday dawns with the most startling discovery. Rollins, the chauffeur, has been found dead. Shot to death in his apartment over the garage. No evidence is discovered, no weapon, no fingerprints, nothing. Now it is late afternoon. Oh, this is a fine mess. A murder in my own home. Everything will come out all right, Henry. You're certain to find the person who did it. Oh, yes, he, he may have had some enemies. After all, we know very little about him. He'd only been here a short while. Don't you understand? I'm the district attorney. Murder has been committed in my own home. Why, if I can't bring this to a solution, I'll be a laughing stock. I'll never be re-elected. We're trying to help you, Henry. Oh, certainly. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to do, but this has got to be kept from the police department. Once they get into it, it'll be plastered all over the front pages of every newspaper in town. Yes. I'll, I'll have to handle this from my own office. Well... Neither one of us has been out of the house, and we haven't told anyone. What are you worried about? Surely a a man like Rollins could have had many enemies. Who knows what he'd been mixed up in? Captain Stone to see you, Mr. Batting. Captain Stone? Oh. Yes, I was afraid of that. All right. Show him in. Afternoon, Mr. Batting. Oh, good afternoon, Captain Stone. Well, what are you doing out this way? We uh, heard about your chauffeur. Really? And who told you? Oh, friend. Body hasn't been moved, has it? No. No, Inspector Stone, it hasn't. Mm -hmm. Still in the room over the garage. 
Well, come on, Skelton. Let's have a look. You, uh, you don't mind, do you, Mr. Banning? Why, why, no. No, of course not. Well, thank you. We'll be back in a moment. All right. You know, I... Got a strange feeling that Jim Blake knows something about this. Blake? Why do you think that? I I don't know. He's just the type to think of something like this. Yes, a perfect setup for him. A murder in my own home. Nothing would please him better. Why would Blake resort to anything like this? Why? Because my dear Blake is in a tough spot. Yes. The more I think about it, the more right I think I am. Well, I'm going to have a talk with him. I don't think Blake had anything to do with it. Really? What do you know about it? Oh, nothing, Father. Then please allow me to handle this in my own way. Henry, why must you be so harsh? I'm sorry, Father. I think you should keep away from Blake. Why? I don't know. I just think you should. Yes. Well, when I want your opinion, son, I'll ask for it. Well, here you are, Mr. Banning. We found it. Found what? Found this revolver behind the garage. Well, no, I... no, don't touch it. We want to check for fingerprints. Oh, of course, I know better than to touch it. Yeah. Fingerprints? Maybe there are none on it. Well, we'll check it just the same. Well, the, the killer would be a fool to leave his prints on the gun. How do you know it is the gun? We'll find out. Ballistics will know. How will they know who the gun belongs to? Maybe it isn't a gun. We already know who killed him. All we need is proof. You no. Know. How do you know? Who did it? Your son did it. What? We were tipped off. My son. That's right. Are you crazy? Why should Clyde kill him? He hardly knew him. Look, Mr. Banning, you think I'd come to your house snooping around unless I had a very good reason? Where did you get your tip? Well, I... I'd rather not say. Who's his friend? Come on, you'd better tell me. I'll bring it out eventually. All I know is that we were tipped off about the murder and told who did it. Your son threatened to kill Rawlins. Who told you that? Jim Blake. He heard him say it. Where did you see Blake, Clyde? Oh, I don't know what they mean. Ask Jim Blake. Come on, Skelton. Let's check that gun with ballistics. A few hours later, boss Jim Blake stands in the study facing the district attorney. There is a tense moment as each waits for the other to speak. Well, Banning, what do you want? I know what you're trying to pull, Blake. You're trying to get at me by framing my son with a murder. I'm not trying to frame him. I just told the police that I heard Clyde threaten to kill Rawlings. So far, there's nothing but circumstantial evidence. Clyde had no reason to kill Rawlings. And without a motive, Clyde is in the clear. Yeah? If you had a scheme in mind to force me to drop that investigation, then your scheme went haywire. You pulled a boner. What do you mean, boner? If Clyde had threatened Rawlings' life, the natural thing for a man in your situation to have done was to approach me instead of the police. Why? Well, you wanted those letters, didn't you? How could you possibly make a deal for those letters now that you've made your information public? <laughs> I'm way ahead of you, Banning. I'm not so dumb as all that. I'm still holding the aces. What aces? The ones I'll throw down for the letters. I think you're bluffing, Blake. I know why Clyde killed Rawlings. I can supply the motive. I'll admit that without the motive, he'd be in the clear. But if I spilled the motive, he'd crack in five minutes. I still think you're bluffing. I know you've got a cinch case against me with those letters. But with what I know, I've got a cinch case against your son that will send him to the gallows. Not only that, but if I do spill it, you wouldn't dare show your face in this town again. Uh, sounds pretty gruesome. I can't imagine what it could possibly be. I'll say you can't. Clyde is really in it, up to his neck. You really think he's guilty? Certainly, but whether he is or not, he had the motive. And the motive for killing Rollins will lead to something that can be definitely proved. You mean material evidence? I do. So in order to prosecute me, you'll be forced to prosecute your own son. Hmm, I'll see to that. Now, you hand over those letters and we'll all be in the clear. Believe me, Banning, I'm not bluffing. Blake, if you're telling the truth, then we're both in a very unfortunate position. You're a crook and I happen to be a stickler for duty. I can't be bribed. You mean you'd actually prosecute your own son? I do. And if he's guilty, he can take the consequences. I don't believe he is, but I know you are. But I think you're crazy. And I still think you're bluffing. Try me. I'll call your bluff. All right, but you'll change your mind, Banning. If you don't, you're a bigger fool than I've ever come across. Let's have it. Get your son in here. All right. Marsha, bring Clyde in here. Yes, Henry. What a sap you are, Banning. Over a couple of punk letters. Huh. Duty. Lot of bourgeois. If you want me, Father? Oh, you can come in too, Marsha. Yes, Henry. What are you doing here? Well, Kate, I've been having a little chat with your righteous father. He sent for me. 
He's a little stupid. He wants to be enlightened. Maybe you can help him. Yeah? Clyde, I understand you paid a visit to Mr. Blake. Huh? Go on. Better tell him, Clyde. What were you doing there, Clyde? Well, I... Blake sent for me. Why? Well, he wanted to talk to me. What about? Well, uh, about what you been saying. I told him what you said to me. Said about what? About Rollins. Uh, what did I say about Rollins? What did you say, Clyde? Uh, nothing. He's lying. Lying about what? We haven't said anything yet. Uh, he, he tried to get me to steal something. Steal something? Now we're getting someplace. Wanted you to steal some letters out of my safe. Yes, yes. He, he offered me a lot of money. Money? <laughs> I didn't even mention money. I didn't have yes, to. Yes, he did. What inducement would money be to you, Clyde? You always get everything you want. I offered you something better than money, kid. But was it, Clyde? He threatened me. Threatened to kill me. <laughs> How do you like that? You're in a tough spot, kid. You better start talking. You threatened to kill Rollins. I did not. I heard you. Why did you make that threat? Well, I was just talking. I didn't mean it. I couldn't kill anybody. But you did say it. But I didn't mean it. What had you done? What did he know? Something prompted you to say it. Now, what was it? Nothing, nothing. I haven't done anything. You killed Rollins. You said you would. I didn't kill him. You killed him to shut his mouth. What did he know, Clyde? Blake's lying. He's just trying to scare me. I'll scare you. You killed Rollins to keep him from telling what he knew about you and my daughter, Ellen. What? Your daughter? She was in love with Clyde. He wanted him to marry her. He tried to shake her, but when she got too insistent, he threw her out of his car, murdered her. I did not. I didn't. Rollins heard them arguing. Clyde dismissed him and drove the car himself. Rollins found Ellen's purse in the car next morning. Rollins told He's me. lying, lying. I told him Rollins wouldn't talk if Clyde got me the letters, but he killed Rollins instead. Was Ellen Blake in your car the night she died? Yes. Did you dismiss the chauffeur? Yes, but I didn't kill her. She jumped out. She jumped out deliberately. Why didn't you tell this? Well, I was going to, but then I got afraid they think I killed her. Rollins tried to blackmail Clyde, then double-crossed Clyde and came to me. Where's the purse? Clyde probably has it. That's why he killed him. I haven't got it. I don't know where it is. I couldn't find it. And you were in Rollins' apartment over the garage. Yes, yes, but I didn't kill him. I didn't oh, kill Ellen. Oh, yeah. Now, what do you have to say, Mr. Banning? Do I hold the aces? No. I'll bring it to trial. I'll find that purse, if there is a purse. And if he's proven guilty, he can pay the penalty like anyone else. And then, Blake, I'll start on you. You're a fool, Banning. You're crazy. Come in. Well, here we are, Mr. Banning. Got quite a bit of dope on this Rawlins killing. What now? There were no fingerprints on that gun, but it was definitely the murder weapon. Ballistics checked it. Well, still doesn't prove my son fired the gun. Ah, that's right. But we did manage to trace the original ownership. And what did you learn? Well, here it is. The gun was purchased four years ago in Seattle. By whom? By Patricia Rawlins. Patricia Rawlins? Mm-hmm. Did you check on Patricia Rawlins? Who was she? Well, we checked on her. We also checked on Rawlins. Patricia Rollins was your chauffeur's wife. They both have a police record. Rollins was a confidence man, three convictions. His wife Patricia was implicated as an accomplice. Anything else? Yes, Rollins disappeared into Mexico three years ago, finally turned up here. Rollins must have had the gun in his possession. Or the wife had it, in which case she could have killed him. Quite possible. You'd better try to locate the wife. Oh, uh, here's a picture. We should be able to locate her without much trouble. What do you mean? Good Lord. Marsha. Yes, Henry? Look at this photo. Do you know who this is? Yes, Henry. Sorry, Mrs. Banning. We'll check your fingerprints with these on police record just to make sure. You don't need to check them. They're mine. Marsha, don't. Why not, Clyde? It doesn't prove anything. Maybe somebody got into the apartment and killed him with his own gun. That's just what happened. He did have the gun, but I killed him. Three years ago, he deserted me. Later, I heard he was dead. Then after I'd married Henry, he turned up here. I knew what he was going to do eventually. But I was in love with Henry. Then when he found the purse, he used it to blackmail me. And when he double-crossed both Clyde and me by going to Blake, we determined to get the purse. But he caught us ransacking his apartment. He pulled the gun and struck me. We all fought for it. Clyde wrestled with him, and I got the gun and shot him. Why did you tell, Marshal? Why? Why not? It doesn't matter now. Tell me, did she shoot in self-defense, Clyde? Certainly. He'd have killed us both. Well... That will clear you with the Rawlins charge. But what about Ellen? He still killed Ellen. Captain Stone, there's a missing purse. Ellen Blake's purse. I want it. You can start looking in Rawlins' apartment. I'm going through with this, Blake, regardless of the consequences. Take a look at him, Captain. A man who'd sacrifice his own son, his own life, for a couple of measly little letters. <laughs> what a sap. <laughs> District Attorney Banning, a determined man, goes through with his promise. The case against his son is in preparation. The 
day of the opening of the trial is set. Then the missing purse is found. And in it is a note to Clyde, written and signed by Ellen Blake. Go on, read it, Clyde. Dearest Clyde, I've tried every way to reach you. I know now that you've been avoiding me. I can't go on. I know you're false, but I love you. I can't help it. So I'm going to kill myself. I don't know how, but some way will present itself. Goodbye, Clyde. I hope you find the happiness I've been denied. I love you, Ellen. Well, there you are. Ellen Blake did jump from Clyde's car. And Clyde, even though he did seem a weakling, was able to fight when it came to a showdown. And Marsha, because of her great love for Banning, was willing to sacrifice everything for him. So Clyde is cleared, Marsha is acquitted, and Blake is sent to prison. And that is the end of a story which might have ended very tragically had it not been for the note in Ellen's purse. Very convenient, that note. <laughs> CBS has presented The Whistler. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler is written and directed by J. Donald Wilson and originates from Columbia Square in Hollywood. Next week, 9.30. I, The Whistler, will return to tell you another unusual tale. Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. You're listening to Hojo Radio. More classic old-time radio coming your way next. Have you heard the weird tales of the Whistler... Gentlemen, we seven scientists have banded together because the government of Austria is in deadly peril. We have evidence that Austria is being dangerously undermined by the Nazis, and that nothing is being done from the standpoint of the law to prevent it. We have therefore resolved to take measures into our own hands and prevent this chaos. At our next meeting, we shall present the names of those in high places who attempt to divide and conquer, and shall decide then as to what action shall be taken against them. And such was the organization in which Hans Minkler, the young, mild-mannered biologist of Vienna, suddenly found himself a member. Hans Minkler, whose whole life was dedicated to the preservation and the saving of human life. Hans Minkler, referred to by his classmates as the man who couldn't kill a fly. <laughs> Saturday night, and again, CBS presents The Whistler. I, The Whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. And so I tell you tonight the incredible tale of The Letter. Hans Minkler, the young biologist, only half heard the speech of the leader of the seven scientists. For Hans was dreaming of his beloved experiments. His experiments and the pretty niece of Monsieur Gallet, the lovely Vielle, who had been living in Vienna these past four years. Kindly Monsieur Gallet was interested in Hans Minkler's theories, and Hans was hoping Gallet might finance them. Well, Dr. Minkler... I've studied the outline of your proposed experiments, and I've come to the conclusion that you can accomplish great things. Oh, well, that makes me very happy, Monsieur Gallet. How much do you think you'll need to carry on? I feel quite sure that I could get along for a couple of years on 5,000. If my cell experiments prove successful, 
Human life may be prolonged considerably. I have all the faith in the world in Hans, Uncle. <laughs> My niece is certainly sold on your ability, Dr. Minglin. So are you, Uncle. You may as well admit it. Young men with your principles are all too scarce today. Europe seems to be saturated with men who claim they want to save mankind. They all seem to want to arrive at it through a destructive method. Well, it's only a temporary condition. Who do you plan to have assist you? Kurt Lassner? Kurt? Um... Well, I haven't decided yet. Kurt is a fine young man. Yes, he was a good student, but he's drifted away from his studies. He's become absorbed in politics. Very well, Hans. I'll start you out with 5,000. Is that the way you want it, Biel? Yes, Uncle, you're a darling. Oh, <laughs> I hope that someday I, I may be able to repay you. See who that is, Biel. Come into the library, Hans. I'll give you a check. <laughs> yes, yes, of course. Oh, good evening, Kurt. Hello, Biel. Well, how are you? Very well, Kurt. Mm, you're very lovely this evening. Thank you. Yes, indeed. The prettiest girl in Vienna. Uh, is Hans here? I said I'd pick him up on my way downtown. Uh, yes, he's talking to Uncle. Uh, talking business. Oh, my, I've had a busy day. Not enough hours to go around. Sit down, Kurt. Thanks. Kurt, why have you given up your career? Biology? No, oh, I don't know. But you could do so much good. You were so well equipped to carry on in science. Think of the things yet to be done. I'm going to do things. Great things. I mean things that will really benefit mankind. Well, that's what I mean, too. <laughs> you know, you sound like Hans. Hans is very sad about your dropping your work. He counted on your helping him in his experiments. Oh, he'll get over it. Besides, those experiments can wait a while. No, Hans is going ahead. Who's going to help him? I am, if no one else. You? Well, how can you help him? I can learn biology. But it'll take a lot of money to do what he planned. He has the money. It's all arranged. My uncle has financed him. Your uncle? Yes. Well, I wish Hans luck. And I'm going to marry Hans. What? You and Hans? Well, what a surprise. Yes, I've made up my mind. I see. Well, I guess... Ah, good evening, Kurt. Glad to see you. Good evening. Hello, Kurt. Oh, have you heard the good news? Oh, yes, Viel just told me. And I wish you both good luck. I hope you'll be very happy. <laughs> and when's the wedding? Uh, wedding? What wedding? Oh, yes! <laughs> me, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Typical absent-minded professor. See, look, I have the money for my experiments. Well, Hans, it's a quarter to eight. We'd better run along. We have an appointment at eight. Hmm? Oh, yes, the meeting. I'd forgotten. Yes, I'll be right with you. Goodbye, monsieur. Bye. Good night, dear. Darling. Good night, Hans, dear. I'll see you in the morning. <laughs> So Hans Minkler reluctantly attends his second meeting, and with Kurt Lassner joins the five scientists in the darkened room. The single low lamp on the table casts their shadows on the wall. The leader is speaking so, again. Gentlemen, we have learned who these fifth columnists are. So it is our duty as loyal citizens to take action against these men. We have learned who the leader is, and naturally he must be the first one to go. In this envelope I have his name. We will now draw lots to select the one among us to carry out instructions which will be read later. Are you ready with the straws, Kurt Lassner? Ready, sir. This is an old and simple method, but since there are only seven of us, it will suffice. Proceed, Kurt. Yes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All of us have drawn, sir. Good. Here is the envelope containing the name of our victim. Who has the short straw? Well, I, I guess I have. Hans Minkler. Here's the envelope. But before you open it, we must tell you what the committee has decided to do about this man. He is to die. Die? And that task has fallen to you. You mean this man is to be murdered? Exactly. What? You don't know me, gentlemen. I, I'm a saver of life. I, I wouldn't consider such a thing for a moment. Herr Minkler, you are a member of this group. You know our secrets. It will be best for us and for you if you completely forget your scruples. Oh, but I... I can't belong to a society with such diabolical purposes. Why, I didn't realize what this was all about. Oh, no, I withdraw. It's too late to think about withdrawing. Do you mean that you actually expect me to kill someone? You have been selected. You are fools. Well, I couldn't kill a fly. I couldn't harm a living thing if the whole country went up in smoke. This is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. You're not scientists. You're a band of madmen. Fiends. Sit down, Hans Minkler. We're not a band of madmen and we are not fiends. We are loyal patriots of Austria who are determined to save our country. Any one of us might have drawn that straw. Well, I don't want to be a party to such a plan. 
I'll not commit murder. Unfortunately, you know too much about us now to pull out. And suppose I refuse? Then you will accomplish nothing. Not only will we eradicate our selected victim, but we'll see to it that you are eradicated with him. Who is this victim? Open the envelope. Very well. What? Why, you are insane. The whole lot of you. Monsieur Gallet is the soul of honor. Monsieur Gallet is one of the most honest men I've ever met. Monsieur Gallet is the leader of the Nazi party. I don't believe it. Why, I'm to marry his niece. Did you say, Monsieur Gallet? Yes, you know that's ridiculous, Court. He'd never do such a thing. Gallet is the leader. We have proof. He also has a very lovely niece. And I'm sure you'd want nothing to happen to her. Would you, Herr Minkler? No. No, I wouldn't. But you you must give me time. Time to think. There is nothing to think about. It has been decided. Galay must be exterminated within 12 hours. Very well. And there's nothing else for me to do. Good night, gentlemen. Good night, Herr Minkler. And remember, if you don't accomplish this task within 12 hours, we will be forced to take care of you. And if we can't find you... We will find the girl. Yes, I understand. Good night. Well, Hans, what are you going to do about it? You've sat in your apartment for two hours now. Which shall it be? Three lives are at stake. The uncles and yours and VL's. <laughs> Hans gets his car and drives to Monsieur Gallet's home. Well, hello, Hans. What on earth are you doing here? I didn't expect you back this evening. Where is VL? Why, she went to some friends. She probably won't be back till after midnight. What on earth's wrong with you? Get your hat and coat, Monsieur Gallet. What? Have you been drinking, Hans? Get your hat and coat. Now, wait a minute. Suppose you explain... There's no what... time for explanations. Get your things. What for? You're coming with me. <laughs> I'm just ready to turn in. You better run along, Hans. You'll feel better in the morning. Put up your hands, Monsieur Gillet. What? <laughs> this is the funniest thing I've ever encountered. Have you really got a gun in your pocket? I have. I hope you don't force me to prove it. Well, this is certainly a surprise. The meaning of all this... I've just discovered that you're the leader of the Nazis. We are trying to undermine the Austrian government. <laughs> are you serious? Yes. Who told you such a thing? There is an organization which is determined to eradicate all Nazis one by one. And you are the leader. Read this. It says, Leader Paul Gallet. Death. This is the maddest thing I've ever heard of. I've been highly active in anti-Nazi oh, They say that's merely a cover-up. Are you a member of this secret organization? Yes. You've been selected to kill me? Yes. Unbelievable that you, Hans Minkler, could be mixed up in such a thing. I think you're being hoodwinked. I am an anti-Nazi. And if you plan to kill me, you must belong to the Nazi organization. Get your things and come along. What do you intend to do with me? That's all planned. Come along. Very well. Hey, you. Give me that. You fool. No, 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 no. You. Monsieur. Monsieur. Good Lord. Hans stands staring at the body of Monsieur Gallet for a few moments. Then in a daze, he turns out the lights, closes the library door, and returns to his apartment. <laughs> for the remainder of the night, he sits at his desk, staring into the darkness, lost in thought. And then morning comes, and Biel at her home opens the library door and... Well, he's been dead about eight hours, Fräulein. Who on earth would do such a thing? He had no enemy. He was quite active in anti-Nazi work. Yes. Here's something we found on the library floor. A, a pipe? Yes. The bowl is hand-curved, has initials on it. As you see, the stem is broken. Have you ever seen this pipe before? Well, I don't remember. There's something else we found, a note, which reads, Leader Paul Gallet, death. Do you recognize the handwriting? No. 
Do you know anyone whose initials are H.M., the initials carved on the pipe bowl? Yes, the, the pipe belongs to my fiancé, Hans Minkler. Your fiancé? What time did you return home last night? I attended a party and got here about one o'clock. I supposed Uncle was in bed. I didn't look in the library. I went straight to my room. What is Hans Minkler's address? I'm sure Hans had nothing to do with this. Are you? He lives at 13 Cronhead Street. I'll run over there. Please don't touch anything in the library. I won't. Good morning. Court. Court, something terrible has happened. Uncle was murdered last night. The police have just left. They, they found Hans's pipe on the library floor. It, it was broken. They've gone to his apartment. Please come over right away. <laughs> Oh, Hans, this is good. The police found your pipe in Galley's library. They're on their way to your place. You've got to get out of the country immediately. Don't wait a moment. Oh, good. Good is terrible. Oh, now control yourself, Ian. Oh, good. I can't imagine why anyone would do such a thing. Good. Do you know where Hans is? Well, I suppose he's at his apartment. Hasn't he called you this morning? He usually does, but he hasn't. They found Hans's broken pipe near Uncle's body. Could I must warn Hans. I must let him know what's happened. Oh, it's pipe, huh? Yeah, it's bad. By all means, phone him at once. Oh, you call him. Of course. It's chronic start 4347. Right. It's ringing. He must be there. He would have answered by now. Where could he be? I haven't the slightest idea. But he always called me before this. Could it? It isn't possible. It can't be. Oh, now, now, just try to control yourself, Yale. Oh, see who it is, Kurt. Special delivery. Sign here, please. Well, thank you. Who's it for? For you. Kurt. It's from Hans. Good heavens, read it. Leaving Vienna on important business. Contact me at 16 Rue de Roche, Paris, under the name of Pierre Cabot, H.M. Well, I don't understand it. What does he mean? What important business? Why should he disappear like this? I have no idea, but it does look strange. Your uncle is murdered and Hans disappears. Oh, but what motive could he have had? But they found his pipe near Uncle's body. You know Hans had nothing to do with it. I'll admit he's always been rather peculiar, never seemed to let loose, always seemed to be on his guard, but... Oh, I can think of no reason for this. What could this important business be? He never told me of it. And why on earth should he go to Paris under an assumed name? Well, that is strange. Kurt, that officer said something. What? Well, you know the knuckle was active in anti-Nazi work. Do you suppose it could be a Nazi? Well, why not? But who? Who do we know that's a Nazi? I, I certainly Wait don't... a minute. You just said that you felt Hans was always on his guard. Do you mean... You felt he was concealing something? Well, there have been times when I felt that, but on the whole, I thought of him as a slow-thinking, absent-minded professor. But it does seem strange that the moment Uncle gave him the check that this should happen and he should disappear. Well, maybe he went to visit our old pal, Jean Renault. You remember Jean? He was one of our classmates. But I have a strange feeling that Hans wouldn't go away like this without telling me beforehand, unless something were wrong. Do you... Do you suppose that Hans has been deceiving us all along? What makes you ask that? Well, it suddenly occurred to me that he spoke French without the trace of an accent. And I remember Jean Renault said once that he spoke English without an accent. So what? Well, if he did, where did he learn to do that? Certainly not by living in Vienna all his life. Oh, I see what you mean. Why didn't he tell me beforehand that he was leaving? But he wrote you this letter. Yes, but it wasn't written by the Hans, I know. Oh, I, I think you'd better forget about it. Good. I didn't tell you this. The police found a note on the floor. It said, Leader Paul Gallet, death. It must have meant that Uncle was an anti-Nazi leader and he was sentenced to die. And if this ties in with Hans' disappearance, then Hans must have been connected with the Nazis. Oh, darling, you're getting yourself all worked up. You don't think Hans was a Nazi? Well, I'll admit the way you've got it all worked out, it sounds plausible, but... If he was a Nazi and he's left the country, what can we do about it? He won't come back. But why should he go to Paris? 
Well, Jean Renault was a good friend of ours. I'm sure Jean knows nothing about Hans being a Nazi. Jean would never suspect him. Maybe Paris is his next assignment. Nazis are just as busy in France as they are here. Let's see that letter from Hans. He says here, contact me, 16 Rue de Roche, Paris. That's Renault's address, 16 Rue de Roche. Oh, good, good. I just can't believe it. How could I have been such a fool? I'll see who it is, darling. I'm Captain Gruber from police headquarters. Oh, come in, Captain. Sorry to trouble you again, Fraulein. But we went to Herr Mickler's apartment. He wasn't there. He wasn't. His car has not been in the garage all night. That's strange. We found this writing on the notepad on his desk. Is it his handwriting? Yes. He's written the same two words over and over again. Galley and V.A. As though he tried to make up his mind about something. But what's become of his car? The car's been found. Where? In a public garage. From all indications, Minkler's left the country. Probably for France. Oh, why France? We've discovered that Hans Minkler is a French citizen. A French citizen? Well, he always led us to believe that he was a native Austrian. Now, uh, we'll want to check things over a little further. We'll be back this afternoon. Please don't disturb anything. No, no, we won't. By the way, what is your name, sir? Hmm? Oh, well, my name is Kurt Lasner. Good day. Kurt, what did you see? What were you looking at just then? Well, what do you mean? What startled you on Uncle's desk? What? Well, well, nothing, nothing at all. Here, let me see. Good heavens, I see it. Here on the desk blotter, Uncle's handwriting, it says, Find Hans Minkler. And it was, Hans. It was. Uncle was trying to tell us who did it. Well, maybe. Oh, to think that he could be so low as to take Uncle's money and then kill him. Oh, please, be here. I just can't believe it. I won't believe it. I must. Well, I'm sorry to say that all the evidence is certainly against him. Oh, come, Yale. Try to get this off your mind. Try to get some rest. The police will take care of everything. Oh, yes, could I? I guess you're right. If Hans did do it, he'll pay. He's the one who'll do the suffering. Believe me. <laughs> During the night, the Nazi hordes rolled swiftly into Austria. Without firing a shot, took over the reins of government. A few weeks later, France declared war. Then one night, Hans Minkler makes his way through the maze of Paris traffic and knocks at the door of number 16, Rue de Roche. Oh, yes? Oh, good evening. Good evening. Is Jean Renault in? Who shall I say is calling? I, um... Pierre Cabot. Won't you come in, Monsieur Cabot? Major Renault has just stepped out. He'll be back shortly. Was he expecting you? Uh, no. Did you say Major Renault? Yes. Since war has been declared, he's gone on the active service list. Oh, I see. I've been phoning for a week, but no one answered. You haven't seen the Major in some time? No, no, I haven't. I've been in Austria for several years. Renault and I went to school together in Vienna. Oh. Are you by any chance Hans Minkler? How did you know that? Why are you traveling incognito? Well, I'm... Well, yes. Where is Renault? I regret to inform you that Renault has been in Africa for some time. He's due back in a few weeks, however. Did you know Monsieur Gallet in Vienna? Why, yes. Who are you? I'm Monsieur Duvaux of the French Sauté. Oh. oh, police. Yes. Did you ever accept any money from Monsieur Gallet? Why, I... Why are you asking me these questions? You never accepted money from Gallet? No. Search him, Harry. Oh, just a moment. Sorry, Minkler. I'll take the bill for Larry. Yes, sir. I don't understand all this. You understand, all right. Well. So you never received money from Gallet. What's this check for? Well, uh, that's to help carry on my experiments. Undoubtedly. Monsieur Gallet was helping you and quite a number of others to carry on experiments. Others? I suppose you say you're new at this game. Game? I don't know what you mean. I had nothing to do with his death. Nothing. Yes, I believe that. Why should you kill one of your own? Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. If you were intending to carry on experiments in Vienna, why is this check drawn on the Bank of Paris? Well, maybe he had a surplus of funds here. <laughs> Indeed he did. How did you know I was coming here? We knew. Just what were your plans? Oh, this is ridiculous. I'm not a spy. 
I was engaged to Marigalee's niece. Really? Some way I got mixed up with an organization which planned to rid Austria of all Nazis. <laughs> they claimed that Monsieur Galet was the leader in Vienna. I denied it. But nevertheless, I, I was selected to, to murder him. Oh, I see. And told that if I refused, that they'd also kill me and my fiancée as well. I decided to get them out of the country. I went to Galet's home. My, my fiancée was not there. I knew there was no time to lose. So I tried to take him away by force. He was suspicious. I mean, we suddenly got into a scuffle and... And then, then someone behind me fired a gun. I don't know who it was. And Galay fell dead. I see. I went to my home. Next morning, learned that they were looking for me. I got out of the country, and in a roundabout way, I, I came to Paris. A good story. But it doesn't hold water. Galay was a Nazi leader, and there's too much evidence against you, Minkler. Come on. Let's go now to headquarters. <laughs> Two weeks later, Jean Reno returns to Paris. Then, six weeks after Austria surrenders, Kurt and Viel escape from the Nazis and make their way to Paris. Jean Reno meets Kurt on the street and asks him to bring Viel to visit him at 16 Rue de Roche. Come in, Kurt. Well, well, Viel. It's been a long time. How are you? Excellent, thank you. So you two are married. Oh, my congratulations. Though I didn't expect it to work out quite this way. No? Why not? Well, I always had an idea that you might marry Hans Minkler. Well, one never knows. <laughs> no, Kurt. One never does. By the way, uh, have you seen Hans? He's in Paris, been here for several weeks. Has he? Yes. Don't tell me you haven't seen him. Well, he told us he was coming to visit you. Oh, yes. He's in Paris. I wasn't here when he arrived. He left several notes. I found him when I returned. But do you know where he is now? Yes. Would you like to see him? Yes, I would. Hans is dead. Dead? What? Dead? Yes. He was executed as a Nazi spy. A Nazi spy? Yes. I got here too late to help him. They had conclusive evidence against him. Why, that's ridiculous. Hans is dead, nevertheless. But what happened? Well... It seems Hans got into some trouble in Vienna and came to Paris to see me. In some way, the Sûreté here was informed that he was a Nazi, was coming here to carry on. But who on earth would accuse Hans of such a thing? I wonder. But they received a letter from Vienna accusing Hans. The Sûreté found a check on him from a high Nazi official. There was nothing that could save him. A check from a high Nazi official? Well, who was the official? Paul Gallet. Viel's uncle. What? Didn't you know about your uncle? I don't believe it. Whether you do or not, he was a Nazi. The Secret Service has known it for years. He may or may not have given the check to Hans for Nazi purposes. But the evidence was against Hans. Then the letter came to the Sûreté saying Hans was a Nazi agent. They found him here and arrested him. That's all there was to it. But who would write such a letter? Hans had no enemies. Would you like to read the letter? Oh, yes. Here it is. Hans Minkler, under alias of Pierre Cabot, has given evidence of being a Nazi spy. Locate him at 16 Rue de Roche, Paris. And that's all that was necessary. Oh, how awful. I, I can't imagine such a thing. Notice the handwriting, Kurt. Why, yes. Viel, this is your handwriting. It is not. I'm positive. You wrote this. No. Don't lie to me. I know your writing. You wrote this letter. All right. All right, I did. I was convinced that he'd deceived me. I was convinced he killed Uncle. Yes, I wrote it. How could you? I never dreamed Uncle was a Nazi. I thought Hans was a Nazi. I was determined to make him suffer. You believe me, don't you? Yes, Viel. I believe you. But I'm awfully, awfully sorry for you. Oh, poor Han. Poor Han. Oh, I'll never forgive myself. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Viel. What a terrible injustice you have done. But someday, perhaps you'll learn what really happened to your uncle. 
It wasn't Hans who killed him. Hans didn't even have a gun, just a pipe. But Hans wanted to get him safely out of the country. And Kurt knew that Hans would never go through with the order of the Secret Seven. So he followed Hans. And when he saw what was happening, he shot Galay and disappeared and let you think Hans did it. Because Kurt was in love with you, too, V.L. <laughs> CBS has presented The Whistler. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler is written and directed by J. Donald Wilson and originates from Columbia Square in Hollywood. Next week, same time, I, The Whistler, will return to tell you the strange tale of Out of the Fog. <laughs> Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Our next broadcast was one of the premier drama programs of the golden age of radio and was subtitled Radio's Outstanding Theater of Thrills and focused on suspense thriller type scripts, usually featuring leading Hollywood actors of the era. Approximately 945 episodes were broadcast during its long run and more than 900 still exist. The protagonist was usually a normal person suddenly dropped into a threatening or bizarre situation. Solutions were withheld until the last possible second, and evildoers were usually punished by the end. We present to you Suspense on Hojo Radio. The Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you Suspense. Suspense. Stories from the world's great literature of pure excitement. A new series frankly dedicated to your horrification and entertainment. Week by week, from the pick of new material, from the pages of best-selling novels, from the theater of Broadway and London, and the sound stages of Hollywood, will parade the most remarkable figures ever known. CBS gives you... Suspense. Tonight's presentation is one of the finest of the contemporary stories of mystery and terror. John Dixon Carr's famous novel, The Burning Court. <laughs> glass of sherry by the fireside of a beautiful suburban home. What could be more comforting? You're an admirable host, Mr. Depart, and it's really a shame our first meeting is under such a cloud. It's also a shame I have so little time to tell you which one of your guests here ah, murdered your uncle last week. <laughs> Now, let's see now. I believe we're all here. Your wife, your friend, Mr. Stevens, Captain Brennan. Yes, and incidentally, yourself. Just who did you say you were? Well, no wonder you've had so much difficulty with the case, Captain. My name is Cross, Godin Cross, the writer. As a matter of fact, it's because of my just completed book, Poisoning Throughout the Ages, that I happen to be here now. And Ted Stevens there happens to be a member of the firm which publishes my work. I'd never seen him until tonight, but I've been told what happened. This afternoon, he began reading my manuscript for the first time on the train. The commuter's train, which every afternoon deposits him safely and soundly here in Crispin. I imagine he was halfway home by the time he finished the first chapter. Then he turned a page. 
attached to the following leaf was a picture. And looking at it, the young man stiffened suddenly and all but cried out his shock. It was a picture of a young woman and under it had been printed famous poisoner Marie Dobre, 1676. Ted Stevens was looking at a picture of his own wife. Imagine, imagine his 25-year-old wife in 17th century costume. The face, the features, even a wistfulness of expression were identical. Even the name, Dobre was his wife's maiden name. But no, 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 that was ridiculous. This woman in the picture was, well, one of his wife's ancestors. Yes, that was it, that was it. Simply an amazing family resemblance. Marie would be waiting for him at the station and he'd have to tell her about it. He wondered why, however, she'd never told him about it. Oh, well, but you don't discuss such an ancestor, do you? Ted Stevens glanced down at the chapter to which the picture had been attached. It was entitled, The Affair of the Non-Dead Woman. Hello, Ted. Stevens was almost jolted from his seat. It was Dr. Weldon, professor of English at the college, an old friend of his. Quickly, he thrust the picture beneath the manuscript and moved over. Hi, I didn't see you, Doc. Oh, here, have a, have a seat. Oh, I thought maybe you were giving me the, uh, what do they call it? The brush off? Oh, no, I... Uh, say, as a matter of fact, Doc, you're the one man I do want to see. Yeah? Very flattering. Remember those discussions we used to have about murders? <laughs> Better than bridge any time. Well, I got the idea that you'd made sort of a hobby out of the old cases, the historical ones. Well, I've studied quite a number of them, yes. Ever hear of a woman named Marie Dobre? Marie Dobre? Marie Dobre. Oh, yes. Uh, th that was her maiden name, of course. One of the finest specialists in arsenic poisoning you could ever hope to find. Oh, we're almost at our station, Ted. Let's get to the door. Yes, a real charmer Marie was. Must have disposed of half a hundred husbands, lovers, suitors, and just plain friends before she was caught. Uh, what happened to her, Doc? She was beheaded and burned. Crispin! <laughs> oh, absurd, laughable. Ted Stevens kept saying this to himself, and yet what he knew was a foolish dread followed him straight through the small suburban station and clung to him as he reached the street. And there in the roadster was Marie, leaning toward him a little to hold the door open and smiling at him. Oh, Ted, what on earth are you staring at? That street light shining on your hair, I like that. Oh, you're tight. Come on, get in the car. <laughs> Then, like a wisp of smoke, it was gone. The whole ridiculous fear, the delusion. When at home, Marie brought the cocktails into the living room. The logs were burning brightly in the fireplace, throwing a soft, dancing glow upon a room that was darkening with dusk. To you, Marie. And to you, dear. As Stevens placed his glass down, he noticed the manuscript of my book. It was there on the table, right where he placed it when he first came in. Deliberately, he turned from it, and then turned back. The manuscript had been moved. Only an inch or so, but it had been moved. Keeping his back to his wife, he thrummed through that early chapter and discovered, just as he knew he would, that the photograph was gone. For a long moment, he thought of what to do. Then slowly, he turned around. This book by Cross I brought home. Yes? Uh, there was a story of Poisoner in it. Rather funny. Her name happens to be the same as yours. Oh, your maiden name, that is. Oh, that is odd, isn't it? 
<laughs> Darling, was she a relative of yours? Why, Ted, you're serious. In a way, yes. Oh, I don't mean it. it's really important. It's just that, well, when you run across a person who's a dead ringer for your own wife and who lived 300 years ago and was a top flight poisoner, well, you like to hear about it, that's all. <laughs> what on earth are you talking about? Darling, be honest with me. Didn't you look at this manuscript when I was out of the room? No. You didn't take out a picture of a poisoner named Marie Debray? I most certainly did not. Oh, Ted, what is this all about? What are you getting at? Oh, just this. Somebody took that picture out of that manuscript since I've been home. Now, who's that? Well, I'll take a look. Wait, I don't feel like... Why, it's Mark Depard. Mark? Ted, wait a second. Yes? Ted... Whatever it is he wants, promise you won't do it. Promise I won't do I it? I mean, promise you won't get yourself involved. Please, Ted, don't go out tonight. Say, what in the world is... Well, anyway, we can't let him stay outside. Mark, how are you? Come on in. Thanks, Ted. Just thinking about giving you a call later. Oh, let me have your hat. Oh, thanks. I, Marie, I, I hope you'll excuse me for popping in like this, but we'll... I wanted to talk to Ted. It, it's rather important. Well, I don't mind at all. Come on, Mark. We'll step into the library. Oh, you mind, dear? Of course not, Ted. I'll be making the sandwiches for her. Oh, grab that chair in the corner, Mark. Well, let's hear it. What's the trouble? Ted, my Uncle Miles was murdered. Murdered? Oh, the talk hasn't reached you yet. But it's already started. Oh, nothing definite, of course. Just that there was something wrong about Uncle Miles' death. But I don't... Mark, are you sure of this? You know he was murdered? I don't know. Of course I don't. I just don't see how it could be any other way. Uncle Miles, you know, had been sick for quite a while. But last Saturday, he seemed so much better that Miss Corbett, uh, that was his nurse, decided to take the day off. And, oh, well, you know all this. You and Marie were over that afternoon. Anyway, Lucy and I went to the club that night, to that masquerade party, and we left the old boy completely alone. I've cursed myself a thousand times since. But what about your housekeeper, Mrs., uh, what's her name? Henderson. Wasn't she around? Oh, sure. In that little house out in back. We told her to look in now and then, but, well, that wasn't good enough. It was after midnight when Lucy and I got back. Uncle Miles was dying. Ted, it looked exactly like one of his regular attacks. But then later, after he was gone... I happened to glance under the chest of drawers in his room. There was a small silver cup under there, almost drained, and Uncle Miles' cat. The cat was still warm, but quite dead. Oh. I managed to get the cat out of the house and buried without anyone seeing me. Next day, I had the contents of the cup analyzed. It was poison? Yes. Arsenic. Well... What do you want me to do? Help me open the crypt. What? I want to have a private autopsy performed. Help me get Uncle Miles' body out of that vault. Oh, I know it's a tough job. The thing is sealed solid, but we can do it. You mean without the police knowing about it? Without anybody knowing about it. Mrs. Henderson's visiting her sister, and I managed to send Lucy over to the club. You must be crazy. You're playing with dynamite, Mark. This is something you've got to tell the police now. I can't take that chance. But they'll have to know sometime. You're only delaying... I've got to know first, I tell you. You don't understand, Ted. There was somebody in Uncle Miles' room that night, handing him something in a silver cup. Mrs. Henderson was on the porch by the window. She saw her. She saw her? Ted. She thinks it was my wife. Oh, Lucy. It doesn't mean anything to Mrs. Henderson yet, because she doesn't suspect anything. But, well, Ted, you've got to see why I've got to be sure, why I've got to know how Uncle Miles died. Because it wasn't Lucy, Ted. I know it wasn't. Of course not, Mark. She had an alibi. Well, she was with you at the club, wasn't she? Yes. Except for half an hour. I see. You'll help me, won't you, Ted? When do we start? As soon as you can make it. Okay. Come on, now. I'll get your hat. You trot on ahead, and I'll come over as soon as I can see Marie. But you're not going to tell her about this? Of course not. I'll think of something. Don't you worry about it. No, thanks, Ted. Thanks a lot. Uh, Marie? I'm coming. Uh, darling, uh, Mark asked me to, uh... I know, Ted. Here, you better take these sandwiches with you. You'll be hungry. Oh, but you knew I was going out? Yes, I knew. You listened to us? I couldn't help it, Ted. 
I had an idea what Mark's visit was about. The talk about his uncle's death. There's a lot of gossip about it in the village. That's why I tried to tell you why I didn't want you to get mixed up in it. But it's too late now, isn't it? I mean, you're going. I can tell by the way you look. Ted, wait a second. There's just one thing I want to tell you before you leave. And that is that no matter what happens, no matter what you find or think or believe, I love you. You'll remember that, won't you? I'll remember you said so, Marie. By the light of a dim kerosene lantern, Mark and Ted Stevens pounded their way through the thick shelf of rock that covered the Depar's ancestral tomb. Pried open the great slab of stone which lay across the subterranean door, and then at last descended to the dank, ink-black chamber. They found the coffin. They dragged it from its crypt and placed it on the cold stone floor. They unclamped the lid and opened it. Mark! It's empty. What? That's impossible. It can't be. But it is, Mark. You know what this means? That Bobby wasn't in this coffin when it was placed here. I'll swear it was, Ted. From the time that coffin was closed on Uncle Miles, somebody, the undertaker or Lucy or me, somebody was with it until it was buried. And the crypt was sealed right after. Then somebody beat us to it. Somebody's broken in here ahead of us. Broken in? Listen, Ted. Lucy and I have hardly left the house since the funeral. Do you think anybody could break in here? Smash through that stone and cement without our seeing them or without our hearing them? Well, well, what? Well, you might as well come on out then. But who was that? Me, Mr. Depard, up here. My name's Captain Brennan. I'm from the office of the Commissioner of Police. From the... I'd like to talk to you if you don't mind, Mr. Depard. Here, uh, follow my flashlight up. But I don't understand. How did you... How did you know about this? By listening, mainly. Do you mind if we go up to your house, Mr. Depard? Why, no. <laughs> Not at all. Oh, thank you. Oh, Freddy. Uh, look here, Captain, I... Uh, Freddy, this is Mr. Depa, Lieutenant Gray. Glad do. to know you, Mr. Depa. And Mr. Uh, Ted Stevens, isn't it? Well, how did you... How did you know my name? Very simple. I got the names of everybody who was here at the Depa's the day the old man died. You and your wife were included. Oh, here we are. But I don't... Uh, uh, Captain, who gave you those names? Why, your housekeeper, of course. Mrs. Henderson? You didn't think Mrs. Henderson saw the dead cat, did you, Mr. Depa? But she did. She also saw you bury it. And uh, we've been interested in the case ever since. Well, nice place you have here, Mr. Depard. Now, let's see. According to Mrs. Henderson, your wife was wearing some kind of a masquerade costume that night. What kind of a thing was it? Well, it was... A... Oh, there, you can see it. It was copied from the dress in that old painting over there. Oh, yes. Hmm. Funny, uh, where's the woman's face? It's always been that way, long as I can remember. Somebody must have thrown acid on it or something. <laughs> Can't blame them much. She was a poisoner. A poisoner? Yes. The story goes that one of my ancestors was responsible for her execution. Marie Dobre, her name was. Oh, yes, I've read about her. Learned all the poison tricks from one of her lovers, guy by the name of Gordon Saint Croix. Gordon Saint Oh, yes, Mr. Stevens, we cops read now and then. Did, did you say... That's French. We call it cross. <laughs> Absolutely no limit to a cop's education, is there? <laughs> but to uh, get back to your wife, Mr. Depar, she was dressed like the famous Marie. Now, when Mrs. Henderson looked through that window... Just a minute, Captain. Mrs. Henderson can't prove she saw a thing, and you know it. Now, what do you mean? I mean you haven't any right to insinuate that my wife was in that room. Well, who's insinuating? I, I'm trying to say that Mrs. Henderson... After thinking it over, realizes she was tricked by the costume. The woman she saw in the funny clothes, handing the cup of poison to your uncle, wasn't your wife at all. What? Because your wife is an unusually tall young woman. And the one Mrs. Henderson saw was fully half a head shorter. More on the order, let's say, of uh, Mr. Stevens' wife. My wife? Captain, Why, this is absolutely ridiculous. Well, I don't know. All right, what's the matter, Mr. Stevens? You're trembling like a leaf. Uh, tell me now, uh, just for fun, 
Where was Mrs. Stevens that night? She was home with me. The whole evening? Certainly. She retired early? Yes, we both did. You, I suppose, were sound asleep by midnight. Yes, I was. Then how do you know where your wife was? Well, I... Look I... here, Stevens. She had to have a costume that would match Mrs. Dick Plaz. How did she manage that? Where did she get it? Well, she, she never had one. She never had a dress like that. And what about our motive? Why did she poison him? I don't know. Not for money, certainly. Then what was it? Hate? Did she hate Miles Dick Plaz? Oh, yes, yes, she did. Claire, no. Oh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know, I tell you. Brown? Yes, Freddie? Phoned and got hold of Mrs. Depard, the nurse, all right. That Mrs. Stevens couldn't reach her. Her phone won't answer. Okay, have her picked up. I'm going home. Stevens, come back here. I'm going to get my wife. Oh, will you stop it, Brenner? My name is Cross. Go down, Cross. Cross? Where's my wife? What have you done to her? <laughs> you fiend, what have you done to my wife? You are nothing at all, young man. Here, 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 sit down. You're lying. Something's happened to her. The police just phoned. There wasn't an answer. <laughs> Why are you here? Why am I here? Well, because your wife, reading my chapter on the Dubrays, realized I knew more about the family than even she did. Because she found my phone number on the front cover of the manuscript. And because I know an exceptional case when I hear one. Does that answer your question? No, and you know it doesn't. Can't you see I've got to... I've got to know whether... Yeah, I see. Whether your wife is that Marie Dobre, who was burnt. Burnt by order of the High Tribunal for all poison cases. The burning court of France. Witchcraft. Black magic. The world across the threshold. You're quite sure, no doubt, also, that I'm Godin Saint Croix, who first wooed her. No, no, my boy. <laughs> no, my real name happens to be, of all things, Tom Simpson. Most unsuitable for a distinguished writing career. And Marie Dobre is no more your wife's real name than mine is Gordon Cross. What? Your esteemed wife was an adopted child, Mr. Stevens. Adopted by people in Canada named Dobre. Remote members of the real family of poisoners. I can't believe it. Oh, why... Why didn't she tell me? You, why? Because until I told her half an hour ago, she didn't know it herself. You see, in the course of my research on the family, I found out about it. And in the course of talking with your wife, I found out something else. How for years she was haunted by the fear that she might be a poisoner by inheritance, by blood. And you can see, can't you, why she never talked about it? Her yes. past to you? Yes, yes. And yet, Mr. Stevens, you had all but made her forget that past. You. And that's why she was willing to lie, to steal a picture, do anything, in order to hold you to her. Yes, yes, I, I see that now. You know, young man, I, I rather think she loves you. But as you will see, though, I, she comes only when I call her. Uh, Mrs. Stevens? You mean she's... Yes, Mr. Cross. Marie, it's you. You're all right? Oh, yes, dear. We're both all right now. And nothing can change it ever. Marie, listen. Don't say Marie, dear. Say Maggie. Maggie? Oh, that's my name, my real name. Maggie McTavish. And it's a lovely name, dear. The most beautiful, gorgeous... Darling, ever. darling, please. You don't understand. The police, they think you had something to do with Miles' death. They think I did. So, now, Mr. Stevens, before we go back to the Depars, don't you think you'd better tell me everything that's been said and done up to date? Having just saved your wife's soul from the burning court, now I'll rest her body from the electric chair. <sighs> yes, Mr. Depard, truly excellent sherry. Don't you think so, Miss Corbett? Yes. Yes, it's very nice. Well, that, ladies and gentlemen, is how I happen to be here. So let us consider first that supernatural hocus-pocus in the crypt... That body that walked out of the sealed tomb. That body that never was in the tomb. Never was in the tomb? No, Mr. Depard. The murderer knew that very soon Mrs. Henderson's story would bring about an investigation. He had to get rid of the well-known corpus delicti. Yes, but who could have kept the body out of the tomb? Who, Mr. Depard? 
Why, you, sir. What? 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 <laughs> I, I don't understand. Well, it's very simple. You had the opportunity. I believe you said yourself you were alone with the body before the burial. And you had the strength. I dare say you carried it down to the furnace. Where it's now, probably nothing but ashes. Ridiculous. Why would he spend an hour smashing into a crypt for a body he knew wasn't there? Why, Captain? Hmm. To impress Mr. Stevens, his witness. And also, apparently, you. Oh, that's perfectly fantastic. Fantastic? <laughs> oh, no, Lucy. Just comic. And I suppose, Mr. Cross, that I also put on a woman's masquerade costume, went into my uncle's room and handed him a nice cup of arsenic. No, <laughs> no, no. That had to be done by a woman. Your accomplice, as a matter of fact... Oh, now, come, come, come. You mustn't all look at Mrs. Depard, because Mark Depard's one noble act was his frantic effort to prevent his wife from being charged with the crime. A crime which he and nurse Myra Corbett committed. Myra Corbett? Why, you... Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Stevens, this quiet little lady beside uh, me. Why would I do such a thing? Money, Miss Corbett. A cutout of Mark Depard's inheritance. Payments for uh, services rendered. That's an absolute lie, Croft. You see, ladies and gentlemen, Captain Brennan never bothered to check Miss Corbett's whereabouts on the night of the murder. Why even think of the nurse? She was the custodian of the old man's health. Oh, you're crazy. You're crazy. And I yet think. who but a nurse could so naturally offer the old man a cup? A cup he was sure contained medicine. You're making it up. The whole thing, you're just And who but Miss Corbett, living right here in this house, would know what kind of masquerade dress she must copy, would know when Mrs. Henderson would pass the window that night, pass and see her, and accept her, she hoped, for Lucy Depard. No, well, that's not true. Oh, yes, Miss Corbett. Yes, Miss Corbett, that dress was the touch that that wrecked you. That was your own idea, wasn't it? Not Mark's. You weren't content with a mere murderer's share of the profits. You wanted a wife share, half of the whole estate. You wanted Lucy Depar convicted and out of the way for good. Mm. Well, I give you a toast, Miss Corbett, with Mr. Depar's excellent sherry to a particularly ruthless poisoner. And yet, you know, on the whole, I'm rather partial to female poisoners. Why, only tonight I... Mr. Cook, what's the matter, Brennan? This man's dead. Dead? And from cyanide, if I know anything. Cyanide from that glass of sherry. Cyanide that a nurse could get quite easily. That glass was right beside you, Miss Corbett, and nobody else was near it. Too bad he didn't drink it as soon as you hoped. A second ago, we had nobody to use against you. But we have now, Miss Corbett. We have now. And I arrest you for the murder of Gordon Cross. Now close to five months ago that the prominent author was murdered. And tonight, Myra Corbett pays with her life for that crime. The former nurse, at first protesting oh, her yes. innocence... Yes, I'm in here, dear. Oh, oh. I thought you might. What did you cut it off for? Huh? What do you mean? The radio. Oh. Oh, yeah, well, I thought you wanted to talk. Oh, Ted, don't you think I know you better than that? What was on the radio? Well, there wasn't any... Okay. It was about Myra Corbett. She goes to the chair tonight. Oh. I didn't think you wanted to be reminded. I don't, really. But making such an effort to hide it only keeps it alive, doesn't it? All right, darling. You know what I came in to ask? If you wanted a cocktail before dinner? The largest one you've got. Fine. I'll get out the ice cube. I know. If I'll fix up the fire. Okay, Maria. A deal. Uh, where are some papers to start it? <laughs> right there by the bookcase. And the name's not Marie. It's Maggie. Because, darling, Marie's dead and gone forever. Now, 
Just a little bit of poison in the drink, Marie. Any kind of a drink. What kind, Ted? Hmm? What kind of a cocktail shall we have? Oh, <laughs> any kind, darling. Any kind at all. You've just heard The Burning Court from John Dixon Carr's famous novel, the first in Columbia's new series of outstanding classics and chills by world-famous authors. Tonight's play, ladies and gentlemen, has one rather special significance we think you'd like to know about. As you perhaps have heard, every fine comedian is said to cherish a secret desire to do an abrupt about face. He pines for the part of a blackguard. Well, tonight you witness the fulfillment of one such desire. The role of that literary and quite infamous diehard Gordon Cross was portrayed by none other than Hollywood's expert provoker of laughs, Charlie Ruggles, here in New York for the world premiere of his latest screen success, Friendly Enemies. The role of Marie, well, that was enacted by a young lady who long ago won national acclaim as one of Broadway's most accomplished dramatic actresses, Miss Julie Hayden. Thank you, Charlie Ruggles and Miss Julie Hayden, for your splendid performances. The play tonight as all plays in this series, was produced and directed by Charles Vander, written by Harold Metford and scored by Bernard Herman. Next week, we bring you an intensely exciting and moving drama, The Life of Nellie James. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Thanks for listening to Hojo Radio. We have more classic radio coming your way next. The Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you Suspense. Suspense. A new series of programs with one strict purpose in view. Your entertainment. Each week at this time, CBS sets aside 30 minutes to excite you, to mystify you, and on occasion to horrify you with a catalog of the world's great thrillers, dramas from the stage and screen, from fiction and radio, dramas that bring you... Suspense. This, the second offering of a new series, is a unique one. Certainly, it is one of the very few pieces of suspense literature that somehow manages to tickle your funny bone while busily engaged in tingling your spine. Make no mistake, though, nobody's kidding. CBS presents its adaptation of John Collier's well-known short story, Wet Saturday. Yes, it's a wet Saturday. Never saw it rain harder. I'm Princey, Frederick Princey, just an ordinary family man. I have a son, a daughter, and a wife. Might be out golfing now if it hadn't been for the rain. I'm Mrs. Princey. I plan to drive over to the nurseries this afternoon for some arbiters. The boarders, you know, but... Oh, the whole lot of them make me sick. Yes, I'm George, son and heir. <laughs> I had a date to go punting. Punting. Couldn't find the blasted punt in this weather, so I'm home too. I. I'm Millicent. I was going to play croquet. That's how I happened to have the mallet. Yes, that's the Princey family. We find them at home. Mrs. Princey, Millicent, George sprawled on a couch, Mr. Princey biting on a dry pipe. Their living room is dull and overstuffed. Rain beats at the windows. They are any middle-class family at home on a wet day, except for one small item. As you sit with them in the living room, you can see through the door to the sun porch a pair of men's feet encased in black boots. They look like the feet of a curate. There's a tenseness in the room. The air is charged with excitement. 
but the feet are very still. Don't keep staring at them. Listen to me, all of you. Don't you see? They hang her. That's what they do. They hang her. Oh, Fred, it's too awful. Awful? It's catastrophic. A supposedly sweet, gentle, intelligent girl, respected, loved by the whole village, doing a thing like this. Think of the publicity, the disgrace. You think I'm going to resign from the bench, the vestry, sell out and live in some foggy hotel abroad? Oh, no, no. No. No, I'll kill myself. I will. I will. Don't be a fool. Any more than you have been, the governor means. Be quiet. Wouldn't be so bad if it were you. Everybody in the village knows you're not responsible. George. Yes? Get off that couch. Sit up on your spine. Uh, you might be of a little use here if you could think. Listen, Governor, this isn't my funeral. Oh, shut up. As long as I can remember, George, you've been a trial and a tribulation to me. Oh, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. You've got to stand it, my dear. And keep that hysterical note out of your voice. Do you hear? Yes. We are... <clears throat> We are talking about the weather. Now, George. Yeah? George, if he fell down the old well, say, uh, striking his head several times, what about it, eh? I really don't know, Governor. What about it? Don't be an ass. I'm asking you to think. He'd have had to hit the side several times in 30 or 40 feet and, and at all the correct angles. Now... now no, I'm afraid not. I'm afraid not. We'll have to go over it all again, Melissa. Oh, no, Father. No, no. I couldn't. I couldn't. Melissa, we must go over it all again. Oh, Fred, you're torturing her. Oh, face facts, Mater. With him lying there, there's no use pretending it's a picnic. <laughs> they might hang you, Melissa. Oh, oh stop. Shaking. Stop it, here. You must stop it. You must keep your voice quiet. Millicent, we are talking of the weather. Now, we will proceed. I can't. I can't. Not about boots. Oh, you should have thought of those boots, Millie. <laughs> I'm not moving them. Oh, sit up, George. Stop shuffling your feet. Now, Millicent, look at me. Answer me truthfully, you hear? Answer me. You were in the croquet corps. Yes. Who knew you were in love with this wretched curate? <laughs> Who? The whole village. <laughs> They've been sniggering about it at the pub for three years past. <sighs> what a filthy mess. Millicent, we continue. You were on the croquet corps. Yes. You were putting the croquet set into its box? Yes. It, it was starting to rain. I was carrying the balls and mallets into the sun porch. The box was there. You heard someone enter the garden gate and come across the yard? Yes. Could you see who it was? Oh, not at first. I was going into the sun porch. I threw down all the mallets but the red one. And turned around. It was with us? Yes. So you called him? Yes. Loudly? Did you call him loudly? Could anyone have heard? No, Father, I'm sure not. I didn't really call him. I I just spoke his name. He saw me as I went to the door. He just waved his hand and came over. How can I find out from you whether there was anyone about? Whether he could have been seen. I'm sure not, Father. I'm... I'm quite sure. So, you both went into the sun porch. Yes. It was raining hard then. What did he say? He said, Hello, Millie. And excuse her coming in the back way, but he set out to walk over to Liston. Yes. And he said, Passing the park, he'd seen the house and suddenly thought of me. And... He thought he'd just look in for a moment. He... He had something to tell me. Go on. 
He said he was so happy. He wanted me to share it. He'd heard from the bishop he was to have a vicarage. And it wasn't only that. It meant he could marry. And then he began to stutter, get all confused. And of course, I thought he meant me. Don't tell me what you thought. Tell me exactly what he said, nothing else. Well, well, Oh, dear. oh stop <laughs> crying. It's a luxury you can no longer afford. Tell me what happened. He said, no. He said it, it wasn't me. It's Ella Bragdon Davis. And, and he was sorry and, and all that. Then he went to go. And then? I went mad. He turned his back. I had the red mallet of the croquet set in my hand. I forgot to drop it in the box when he came. And I... Did you shout or scream? I mean, as you hit him? No. no. I'm sure I didn't. Did he? Come on, speak up. No, Father. And then? I threw it down. I came straight in here. I went to look for Mother. That's all. Oh, my poor baby. No. No one. Oh, leave the child no. alone, Fred. Not such a child, Mater. Hmm, Millie, I had no idea Keep you had... Keep quiet. I'm thinking. Hmm. You see, George, he probably told people he was going to Liston. Certainly no one knows he came here, for he, he didn't decide until he crossed the park. He might have been attacked in the woods. We must consider every detail. A curate with his head battered in. Don't, Father, don't. A curate, head battered in. Now, who would want to kill with us? Oh, kill with us? Well, I would with pleasure. How do you do, Mrs. Princey? Oh, Captain, Captain Smart. Oh, sit down, pray. Mustn't get up for me, Mrs. Princey. You either, Millicent. My word. Just being neighborly on a bad day. I wanted to ask you about those dahlia bulbs, Princey. Took a short cut on account of the rain and walked right in. Knew you wouldn't mind. Oh, he heard you, Father. <laughs> My dear. We, we can all have our little jokes. <laughs> Don't pretend to be shocked. This way, Smollett. This chair facing the fireplace. Sit down, Mother. Well, just uh, straightening the curtains to the sun porch, dear. It looks so gloomy out there. Might as well shut the rain oh, out. Just talking about a little theoretical curate killing, Smollett. <laughs> you know, young people these days like thrillers. Pass on his side. Justifiable pass on his side. Have you heard about Ella Bragdon, Davis? I shall be most properly laughed at. Why? Why should you be laughed at, Smollett? No, oh, and a shot in that direction myself. <laughs> she half said yes, too. Haven't you heard? She told most people. Now it'll look as if I got turned down for a white rat in a dog collar. Oh, too bad. Oh, fortune of war. Yeah. Fortune of war. Odd how it happens, isn't it? <laughs> Sit down, Smollett. Millicent, console Captain Smollett with your, your best light conversation. You too, Mother. George and I have something to look at outside. Is this rain, you know, very bad, very bad. Uh, come, George. Right, old governor. Maybe we'll need raincoats, what? Oh, I don't think so. Just make yourself at home, Smollett. Make yourself at home. A cigarette, Captain Smollett? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, nasty day to be going out. It's something about the old well. Just off the sun porch door, you know. This terrible sodden weather seems to have loosened some of the stones. Oh, too bad. Dash too bad. Spoils the tennis and croquet, I mean, a day like this. Doesn't it, Millie? Doesn't it, Millie? Oh, yes, it does. She was practicing out on the croquet court earlier, but... Uh, oh, do pull your chair nearer the fire, Captain. It was so damp, we thought it would be cosy to light it. Thank you. I'm quite comfortable. I, uh, I hope you don't feel too bad about Ella Davis. Can't always win. Can't see, though, what you women see in these bloodless clerics. Oh, I always thought Mr. Withers was, uh, is a very charming man. Quite agree, but why should anyone want to marry him? You wouldn't want to marry him, would you, Millie? Not now. 
That is, I... Are you? Oh. Oh, no, of course not. Smollett. Oh. Yes, yes, Princess. Good Lord, man, you... You come in on a fellow suddenly. <laughs> Guess I did. Oh, oh, don't mind this old double barrel shotgun. Been working on it. Smollett, may I have your attention for a minute? There's something on the sun porch I'd like to show you. Why, yes. Yes, of course. Smollett, George and I went out to see if we could shoot some rats which have been driven out of the old well by the high water. Afraid they might get into the house. Now you must listen to me very carefully. Very carefully or you will be shot by accident. Princey, what's got into you? You heard me ask as you came in, who would kill with us? You also heard Millicent make a comment, an unguarded comment. Well, what of it? Very little. Unless you were to hear that Withers had met a violent end this very afternoon. And that, my dear Smollett, is what you are going to hear. What? Withers? Yes. Who killed him? Millicent. Good Lord. Yes, it's a mess. And of course, you would have remembered and guessed. Maybe, yes, I... Yes, I, I suppose I should. Therefore, you constitute a problem. Why did she kill him? Oh, it's one of those disgusting things. Pitiable, too. She deluded herself that he was in love with her. Good heavens, Millie. Oh, yes, of course, I... I see. He had told her about the Davis girl. I understand. Now, I have no wish, as you will comprehend, that she should be proved either a lunatic or a murderess. I could hardly go on living here after that. I suppose not. On the other hand, you know about it. Yes, I see that makes me a problem. <laughs> You're wondering if I could keep my mouth shut. If I promise... I am wondering if I could believe you. But if I promise... If things went smoothly, yes. But not if there was any sort of suspicion, any questioning. You would be afraid of being an accessory. Why, I don't know. I do. What are we going to do? I, I can't see anything else. You, you'd never be fool enough to do me in. You, you can't get rid of two corpses. Oh, I regard it as a better risk than the other. It could be an accident. Or you and Wither could both disappear. There are possibilities in that. Listen, you, you can't. I can, but there may be a way out. There is. Smollett, you gave it to me yourself. I... I did what? You said you would kill with us. You have a motive. Oh, look here, I, I was joking. Of course you saw that. You are always joking. Listen, Smollett, I can't trust you. You must trust me. Else I will kill you now in the next minute. I mean that. You can choose between dying and living. Go on. Now, there's the old well just outside the sun porch door. That's where I'm going to put with us. No one outside knows he has come up here this afternoon. No one will ever look there for him unless you tell them. You must give me evidence that you have murdered with us. I murdered him? Why do you want that? So that I shall be dead sure that you will never open your lips on the subject. I see. What evidence? George, hit him in the face. Sure. George, don't... Ah, ah. Keep out of this. Oh, Captain, you should be more careful. Look what your teeth did to my knuckles. Again, George. Okay. Oh, God, I can't stand it. Oh, can you? Keep quiet. You women, keep out of this. I'm sorry, Smollett, but there must be traces of a struggle between you and Withers. Then it will not be altogether safe for you to go to the police. <laughs> Can't you take my word, man? I will when we are finished. George? Yes? Get the croquet mallet. Right, Governor. Take your handkerchief to it. In there, on the sun porch floor. Yes. Yes. I got it, Governor. There, Captain. There's the weapon. As I told you, Smollett. Now, you'll just grasp the end that mashed Wither's head. I shall shoot you if you don't. But, good Lord, you can't. 
All right. There. That's it. Now deposit it out by the side of the house, out of the rain, of course. No. Wait, George. Eh? Yeah? First, you'd better pull a few hairs out of his head and put them under the nails of Withers' right hand. Uh, Prince, have you gone mad? Do you know what you're doing? With this gun, yes. Go ahead, George. Yeah. Uh, sorry to muss your hair up, Captain. Uh, uh, oh, shut up, uh, Smollett. There. That's all we need. Now for Withers, and we'll fix it right up. Be right with you, Governor. Smollett, you may turn around. Withers is just there in the sun porch. Draw back the curtain. Good Lord, Prince. Yes, messy. But we'll get him fixed up. Now you, Smollett, you've just got to drag him through the door and dump him in the old well. <laughs> just beyond the door, Captain. I, I won't touch him. I won't. I... All right. Stand aside. Out of range, George. Right. Only one place I want this bullet to go. Father. Oh, Father. Keep quiet. My aim's none too good. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I... That's... I... Better, Smollett. Much better. Go on now. In here. You'll have to take him outside. By the shoulders ought to do it, Captain. Keep quiet, George. Go on, Smollett. Go on. You've seen dead men before. Drag him. Drag him. I'll just hold the gun here to make sure that everything goes all right. Oh, Mother, come away from the dim window, dear. Don't look. But, Captain Smollett, your father is a very resourceful man, Millicent. I'm sure what he's doing is right. But the Captain, I can't, I can't stand it. You mustn't question your dear father. I say, are you two still at it? There's enough trouble around here without blubbering. I'm not blubbering, George Pinsley. So, you see, Smollett, everything is perfect. They'll never look in our way. You see how safe it is? I guess it is. Oh, good heavens, man, you're, you're dripping wet. Why, why didn't you slip your raincoat on? <laughs> Tea ready, my dear? In just a minute, dear. I'll ring for Bridget. Ah, exactly what you need, Smollett. Cup of tea. Best thing in the world to ward off a cold. Sit down, won't you? Oh, don't mind getting the chair wet. Cigarette? Help yourself. I stick to my pipe, you know. Funny how... Mrs. Princey, everything's hot, ma'am. Oh, Bridget, yes. Put the tray in front of me here, on the table. Yes, ma'am. That's it. I say, Captain, you've gone and cut your lip. I, I just knocked it. Oh, how dreadful. Here, Bridget. Yes, Give the Captain this cup. No, no, thank you. I, I, I rather think I'll be running along now, if you don't mind. Oh, my Captain Smollett, without any tea. Oh, yes. If you don't mind, Mrs. Princey, if... If I could just have my raincoat. Oh, I'll get it for you, Captain. Oh, this is very distressing, Smollett, very. Oh, I, I'll be all right presently, I'm sure. Here we are now. Let me help you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, young man. There. I better go out the front way, Smollett. The walk is dry. Oh, let me hold the door for you, Captain. <laughs> Don't worry, old fellow. Don't worry at all. No, no. I... Good afternoon. Nothing serious, I imagine. A little rest and he'll be as right as rain. By the way, Millicent, you're not looking any too well. No, not well at all. I'm sure it was that croak he caught. Being outdoors in weather like this is simply foolhardy. The mate is right, Millie. You saw what happened to Captain Smollett. Oh, come along, dear. I shall give you a hot foot bath and put you to bed. And a couple of days in bed and you'll be fine again. Get plenty of rest, Millicent, and don't worry about a thing. That's the best cure. <sighs> well, I guess I'll have a little rest too, Governor. It's a fine afternoon for a nap. Indeed it is, son. Well, enjoy yourself. I'll see you later. I'll see you all later. Your number, please. Oh, would you get me the police station, please? Police station? Right away, sir. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Police headquarters, Sergeant Yancey speaking. Oh, hello, Sergeant. This is Prince here of Abbott's Road. I, I believe you know me. Oh, indeed I do, Mr. Prince. Sergeant, a horrible thing has just happened. Quite extraordinary. Murder, in fact. Murder? I'm afraid it looks rather bad for, well, for, for a close friend of ours, unfortunately. We saw him do it. I, I think you'd better send someone over right away. Well, our man should be there right about now, Mr. Princey. I, I beg your pardon? I say, our man should be there now. Constable Martin has his post right below your house there. Just rang in. Seems Captain Smollett was with him. Uh, Captain Smollett? He reported some rather queer goings on at your place, but I certainly didn't understand it was murder. Just don't touch anything, Mr. Princey, and don't worry. Don't worry at all. No. No, 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 I, I won't, Sergeant. Thank you. Governor! Governor, where are you? I'm right... I'm right here. Stop shouting! Oh, we... We have some visitors, Governor. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, I, I can see that. Well, Constable, g good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Princey. And Smollett, I, I say what a, what a remarkable fellow you are, coming back like this, here to reenact the crime. Only the one against me, Princey. The one against the curate, I'll leave to you people. <laughs> Extraordinary sense of humor. Mr. Princey, I just had a look at what's in your well. Not a pretty sight, that. Not pretty at all. Yes, Captain Smollett was thorough, if nothing else. You saw him when he did it, sir, out in the back? No, quite. We were just returning from a walk. Smollett evidently had been laying for the curate, hiding out in those bushes by the road, I imagine. He was never inside this house. Never. And uh, you say, Captain? I say that while I was inside this house, a guest of the family, I was coerced into dragging the curate's body outside and dumping it in the well. Well... There we are. Uh, not entirely, Constable. Uh, I'll just remove my raincoat. There. Uh, and demonstrate how damp I got my clothes when I went outside without it. No. That's interesting, isn't it? Uh, quite. <laughs> he undoubtedly removed his coat at some point between here and your post. I might as well tell you that his weapon, a red crooked mallet, is out by the side of the house. I shouldn't be at all surprised, but that you'd find his fingerprints all over it. All over the end of the mallet, Constable. The end that mashed withers his head. And not the end I'd have had the grasp in order to do the mashing. Governor, <laughs> that's a decent try, Smollett. <laughs> but it won't work. There must be other evidences, Constable. You'll undoubtedly find them when you examine the body. Oh, he means my hair under withers his nails. Well, sir, if you look carefully, I believe you'll find a few of my precious hairs under his son's nails, too. Here, what are you Shut trying to... Shut up! Constable, this is an utter waste of time. So far as the violent struggle between Smollett and Withers is concerned, Smollett's face speaks for itself. Quite eloquently, I believe. Oh, but no more eloquently than your son's knuckles. As you see, Constable, a fresh abrasion. He did that on my teeth. Or did he? What? I say, or did he? He might have done that on Withers's teeth. <laughs> oh, I see. I see what you mean. But, but, but I didn't. G Governor, he said I... Oh, could... keep still, you nitwit. Let me think. Let me think. As a matter of fact, George, the more I think of it, the more I'm convinced it was your voice I heard. Quite a vigorous quarrel. Something about the curate jilting your sister. Oh, don't be ridiculous, Smollett. Very well, Princey. If your son didn't do it, who did? That's what I'd like to know. How about it, Mr. Princey? Well, that... That is a sticker, all right. <laughs> George, my boy, it looks like you're elected. Elected? What do you mean? I didn't do it. Why, I, I had Keep nothing to do... Keep your mouth shut, will you? I won't. I'm not going to take the blame for her. Millie did it. She did it with that mallet, I saw. You could prove that? Prove it? I... I... Yes, her, her fingerprints on the mallet, the handle. Why, George, don't you remember when you made me touch the mallet? Huh? When you picked it up with your handkerchief? No, I... George, I'm sure you wiped that handle clean. Oh, well, I could hardly expect you to remember that if you, if you can't even remember killing the curate. Governor, I... I told you to keep still. But, Governor, you, you, you're not going to turn me over. You, as you... long as I can remember, George, you've been a trial and a tribulation to me. Governor, I... You shouldn't have done it, son. You really shouldn't. No, George, that was definitely wrong. <laughs> I say, Prince.
Quincy. I think I'll have that cup of tea after all. Nothing like it in weather like this. Wet Saturday from the short story by John Collier. You have just heard the second in Columbia's new series, a series designed to bring you the best in thrill entertainment. Outstanding dramas from the field of fiction and radio, stage and screen. Dramas of pure... Suspense. This Columbia feature is produced and directed by Charles Vanda, with script by Harold Medford and score by Bernard Herman. Be with us again next week at the same time when we present Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Thank you for listening to Hojo Radio. We'll be back again very soon. Thank you.